coming. Uh, there's many different walks of life represented here. Uh, and I uh, hope that we'll be able to get uh, into discussion. The idea of these panels is to leave time for audience discussion. Um, so this is a beginning meeting uh, on trying to develop a longer term program on innovation, its transfer into intellectual property and from there to the market and to with the goal eventually of growing the economy. Uh, and the universities are the central engine in many ways for innovation. Peter Price here, I think, is an example. We have Qualcomm, another example. We have many examples um, of um, innovation from the university that have ended up making a huge difference uh, in the economy. And so what we hadn't done at uh, Cal IT2, in particular here at the Qualcomm Institute, the UCSD division of Cal IT2, um, is have a, a, a sort of from innovation to the economy grows. And that's really what we're looking at. So we've divided it into three panels. Um, the first one is really going to talk more about um, the role of the university in both um, fostering and hopefully accelerating innovation, about how the university actually formally takes these innovations and ends up defining intellectual property, and then how does that intellectual property uh, get transferred uh, into the uh, community and we'll have actually an example of one such process that just happened uh, and is uh, going to be talked about. The second one is really, okay, let's start from that. And then how do we get to startups? And we're fortunate that uh, our new dean of engineering, Al Pisano, has done this himself personally uh, something like 10 times or, or more uh, making companies. So he's going to share some ideas. Uh, and then we have uh, one of the best uh, uh, incubators in town, Eva Nexus, and then, of course, our Connect program, which goes back uh, to Bill Otterson on, on how to help entrepreneurs, how to help innovators in the university become actual entrepreneurs and builders of companies. But then once the companies are out there in the marketplace, how is it that... Um, uh, how is it that these things actually, in the end, uh, increase uh, wealth? And so we're going to have a, a good example uh, with Peregrine Semiconductor of how uh, that is an ongoing uh, development from intellectual property to actual economic growth. Uh, we're going to have an example uh, from one of our own faculty who has taken ideas out, licensed them, created companies, and added exit. So how does that whole cycle work? And then. Um, from the venture investment community. We have the president of San Diego Venture Group that's going to uh, say how he has seen things change uh, over this uh, period. So three different, each an hour long uh, sessions. Now, one of the underlying themes of all this is what I've just seen sound, sounds like a very benign sort of environment. But in fact, there are different folks around the world uh, that have different ideas about um, what's, how to take innovation and end up creating their own economic growth. Uh, and we have Mark Anderson here who's on our advisory board who's going to talk for a few minutes to sort of set that stage because a lot of this is about protecting that value as it goes up the chain and it, for many years that meant legally protecting it and we will hear from that about how you do patents, how you do that sort of thing. But there's also how do you actually you know, physically, cyber-wise, et cetera, protect that intellectual property so that, in the end of the day, that economic growth that's supposed to come actually comes and isn't short-circuited effectively. And that's a growing problem worldwide. So Mark is a, a one of, you know, very good friend of mine. He's on the advisory board uh, of Cal IT2. He is the CEO of. Uh, the uh, Strategic News Service newsletter, which is uh, called by many the most accurate uh, weekly uh, newsletter uh, in the business in terms of making predictions. Uh, he is the founding chair of the um, 
uh, Future in Review Conference, uh, which The Economist has referred to as the best technology conference in the world, and to which uh, this building, Cal IT2, has, uh, and, and Qualcomm Institute has uh, had repeated engagements of when they were meeting in the Del Coronado, actually coming up here for an evening to play with our toys uh, and to understand what is coming in the next three, five, ten years uh, ahead. Uh, he has about 200 sea level people attend that each year in May, uh, now in, Lag in Laguna Beach. Um, and I'll be there for that whole meeting as usual. Uh, so Mark, um, Mark is also the founder of, um, of Invent IP, uh, which he's going to talk a little bit about to you, uh, which uh, is a, a organization of both uh, corporations and uh, government officials that is concerned by uh, this issue of uh, short circuiting, uh, that, the process we're going to talk about today. So Mark. Hi, everybody. Glad you're here. I would like to, uh, in a very few minutes, indeed, try to change uh, your whole world view about how the global economy works. And I'll try and do it in, in two or three very simple steps. Uh, so, uh, and the reason I'm doing this is because I had to go through this process over about 10 years, kind of forgetting everything I was ever taught at Stanford, flush that, delete, erase and then look at the real world and how it works, and it turned out there was no set of numbers that were in the middle. There was no intersection set at all. Uh, so uh, I really literally had to start from scratch to figure this out. And in doing that, I began by looking at uh, technology, because that's my world. I, I spent my whole life in science and technology. And I began by looking at country national business models. And so I looked at uh, Japan and South Korea and China and the US and EU and UK so forth, try to figure out where does the money come from and how do people make money. And uh, what I found out is kind of why we're here today. So uh, here, here is a short, I, I was lucky enough to, to be a person who not only saw real estate going up too quickly back in 2007, of which everyone in this room is probably part of that set, but I actually publicly called the crash in March of that year on TV in London. And the way I did that was because I realized a really important thing about economics. In the static world of balance sheets, a lot of lies. I'm going to shock you. There are a lot of lies on balance sheets. But if you look instead of at balance sheets, at flows, there are no lies. If I give you $5, I gave you $5. You can lie later about what your net worth is, but you can't lie about the fact that I gave you the $5. We need to review how we understand our own understanding of the global economy in that context. We need to start looking at flows, not at static descriptions. The other thing that I learned, which is even simpler, and I hope everyone here will agree, just by the fact of your presence, in the post-information age, technology drives the global economy. Now, Congress has a lot of trouble with this idea, but that's Congress. That's not the people in this room. I think there's one person who's technically trained in Washington in the 435 people in Congress. So uh, if you wanted to picture, and this is the best way I have of describing this, the future wealth of the world and have the best indicator, the best leading indicators of where that was going to be and how much, here's the, here's the simplest and most accurate and best way I know of doing it. You close your eyes and you picture the planet and you put a little red flag in every time there's an invention and then every time that invention is moved, either by sale or theft or disclosure or whatever happens, put a big red arrow from where it started to where it goes, and we're done. That picture is the best predictor of wealth that I know of. It's better than gold. It's better than cash. It's better than farming. There's nothing else like it. So in the post-information age, that's who makes the money or most of the money. And in fact, I'll go even further. Again, while Congress is having a lot of trouble figuring out whether it's you know, 3% or 5% of our economy, in China, they have taken the world and divided it into 417 distinct economic sectors, each of which is targeted for theft. And I would like you to picture a table like this where I put down 417, 
all a card, a, you know, a little card, a little baseball card for each one of those sectors, and offer to have you take off that table any of them that are not driven by technology. And my guess, and I've been doing this now for like a month with no results, my guess is you won't be able to do it. There won't be one card on that table that you can pull off claiming that that sector was not driven by technology, whether it's farming, it doesn't matter what it is. So that's the world we really live in. That's the actual world of economics. It's driven by technology. And if you watch those flows of intellectual property, you will understand where wealth will go. And that pretty much brings us right to today. So we learned, I learned, we learned, that there are nations whose whole idea of how to prosper is to take somebody else's invention and patriate it internally, redigest it, and spin it back out into the global marketplace at half price. And I call that model the info mercantilist model. I'm not making it, this is something that nations are actually proud of doing. So it's not a secret. If you wanted to understand the global economic conflict or struggle or however you want to state it, in the most stark terms, I think all you would have to do, Sherwin-Williams-like, is picture the globe and color the countries which believe in taking IP on one hand and color with a different color the countries that invent IP. And you're done. The question then becomes, how many of each can you have? At what point does, do the scales tip where you can't, the inventors can't invent fast enough to stay in business. And at that point, the whole global economy starts to stagger. So what we've seen so far, and this is not abstract, this is history, we've seen Canada's most important company, Nortel, destroyed because of this problem. We've seen Motorola go down partly because of bad management and partly because of this problem, which was one of America's most important, historically important companies. This is an abstract. We've now seen the, almost the entire sector of telecom equipment wiped out, which is probably the most strategic sector that exists from a technical perspective. The infrastructure of every country is involved. So this is not abstract. This is real. And Larry and I, are, as my advisory board member, we're working on this problem, trying to figure it out. And one reason we wanted to have this meeting was to expose it to a larger audience in the best way we can. And the framing we want, it, want you to take away from all this is uh, a higher valuation for and, and concern about IP, intellectual property, because of the role that I just described it playing in the health of the global economy. It's not even being selfish, it's being selfless. But in understanding what drives the global economy today and how your country or your company or you are going to make more or less money over the next three generations, I believe this is the clear answer. And the one question that's unresolved is, will we be good enough as inventors to, in protecting our, our assets, our IP, so that we can keep playing this game, keep doing this? Otherwise, the return on investment declines, return on assets decline, CEO gets fired, company goes down, rewind to again, not so likely. So it is really important, from what we've seen so far, to get this into play and get it right. And most of all, we need to have CEOs and entrepreneurs recognizing, and people at the university, recognizing that this is a serious struggle. This is a serious contest between two different models for how nations should make their money. And as the center place of invention, I think that the university setting is most uh, exciting and most at risk. I can tell you that those who want to steal things find it much harder to go after someone like Boeing where they have a lot of money to spend on security than the smaller supply chain companies. So they do go over the smaller companies. So they've learned very quickly it's easier to go after the littler guys. And of all the, the security risks that are easiest, the university is the most easy. So uh, while the university strives to be what it should be, a place of learning, uh, it is also unfortunately, not of its own will, been cast into this position of being the, um, the hearth of where things are invented. Also, the focus, the central focus of those who would like to have that IP. So it puts you into a fascinating and difficult position, which at least needs conversation. I think. And uh, from Invent IP's sake, uh, we just hope that you do have that conversation. We'll be seeing you all, I hope, at the reception when this is all finished. 
And if you want to uh, learn more about Invent IP or why we started it, uh, feel free to ask me at that reception, or we'll try to reach you later. So thanks very much. So it's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. And um, the first panel discussion is on the role of research universities in defining, protecting, and innovating with IP protection in the university. And we have three excellent speakers who are going to talk about their different perspectives um, on this ecosystem. And uh, we're going to start with Bill Decker. Um, Bill is the Associate Director of the UCSD Technology Transfer Office. Prior to joining UC San Diego in 2001, he received his PhD from UVA in engineering physics in the area of nonlinear dynamics. Uh, Bill was employed for five years at a medical device startup, first based in Florida, then in California. Bill's work at the company resulted in eight issued US patents and several patents issued and pending outside the US. The patents were acquired from the company by Zeiss and later the company was acquired by GE Healthcare. Uh, over the years, Bill has been an invited guest speaker at meetings sponsored by the American Physical Society, the American Nuclear Society, the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics, the International Society for Analytical Cytology, the Association for Women in Science, and the National Association of College and University Attorneys. Um, so, Bill, um, please, we look forward to your presentation. on the ground in terms of uh, IP creation. Um, how do I control the slides? Do I, do I, sh yeah. should I stand up there? I might, I okay. Might there. All right. You can just or, get uh, next. Yep. So, so our mission in the tech transfer office is to promote and facilitate the transfer of these innovations for the benefit of the university community and the public. That is kind of the, the whole approach of what I'll be taking uh, with my talk and, and how we do that uh, in terms of benefiting the public here at a, at a research university. But first, we have to answer the question, what is innovation? And you kind of start in this flow chart of first starting at an innovation, something written on the back of a napkin, for example. Uh, or something buried in a research article that maybe has some commercial utility. Then you can go and take the next step and wrap some formal intellectual property around it, apply for a patent. And then eventually what you want to do is you want to see that end up in a product. That is how uh, we in our office view the benefit to the public. Is the, the fundamental research making its way through this uh, supply chain, if you will, um, into uh, products out in the marketplace? Sometimes you just have an innovation and you don't wrap the uh, formal intellectual property around it. Uh, we still do, can do those types of licenses where they just, um, they still end up in products. So we will license patents, copyrights, and when I talk about copyrights, I'm talking about software, images, videos, designs. Um, we even have uh, successfully licensed questionnaires. Uh, there's a shortness of breath questionnaire that has come out of the medical school that's quite popular in, in certain um, COPD uh, clinical trials. Tangible research materials, certain cells, uh, things like that. And we also have uh, um, licensed certain trademarks. Believe it or not, the word catch is trademarked. It's owned by uh, UC, and we've licensed it rather successfully uh, in the area of children's um, health. So here in, tech transfer, in the tech transfer world at U.S. universities, we have a, a particularly, um, uh, let's say it's a, it's a patchwork environment of different policies and laws that we have to pay attention to. The major one is the Bayh-Dole Act of 1980. Uh, that is where the federal government said, okay, we're going to fund your research and we're going to allow you the opportunity to own the IP. Prior to that, the federal government owned all the IP, and what they found was nothing was being done with it. It was sitting on the shelf growing dusty. It wasn't getting into the products. We also have various other uh, laws, state and federal, that we have to follow. We also have the university mission and the university uh, culture that we want to pay attention to. Things like academic freedom, uh, 
things like um, the mission of the university. Are we pro still protecting the research mission? Are we still protecting the academic mission in our licensing? If I license a technology and it negatively impacts a student, that's a problem. That's not something that we want to do. So we have all of these different and various expectations uh, in order to do what we do, and we still do it rather successfully. I'll be getting to some of the numbers at the end. But we have a number of different vested interests. Uh, for example, we, we have inventors who don't want to see patents filed. They want it to be, go to the public domain. We have other inventors who want to see patents filed, and they're very interested in, in the return on that investment and seeing some uh, financial return to them. We have, uh, so we have a variety of points of view uh, within the university. But ultimately, again, we're aiming towards that end goal of seeing products result. And the return to the inventor, the reward that comes back, is 35% of the net revenue from our licensing activities goes to the inventors. And for copyrights, it's 33% of the revenue. Those, uh, that incentive to the researcher um, is part of the requirements of the Bayh-Dole Act. Now, uh, um, the Bayh-Dole Act is, is often what we manage inventions towards, all of its various requirements. For example, within the Bayh-Dole Act, we require uh, our licensees, when it's federally funded, to substantially manufacture the technology in the US. They can apply for a waiver to the federal government, or actually they apply through us, um, but in those licenses, we are asking them to, to make the product here in the U.S. That can, in certain industries, uh, present a real problem if all of the manufacturing has moved offshore. But we try to work through that, making both the federal government satisfied and the licensee satisfied. And we see that in a number of areas. Universities have banded together to talk about, okay, what, what is it that we want to think about when we as a university license intellectual property? And there's various points to consider that we've publicized. Um, we want to reserve the right to practice the invention. In other words, if I license a faculty member's invention, he can continue to do research on it. He can continue to collaborate with, uh, his, um, with his other nonprofit research partners. Um, none of that is prevented by the licensing activity. We want to make sure products result. We don't want to see things shelved, and so on and so forth. Um, we want to minimize things like conflicts of interest. We want broad access to research tools. Uh, one of the big things we want to be is mindful of export regulations. So when we license our technology, we require our licensees to comply with the export control laws. That is a, a clause in the contract. They would be in breach of the contract if they neglect to comply with the export control laws. But one of the big questions we face, we get roughly 400 disclosures a year. I'll show uh, specific numbers later on. It's expensive. If, for example, we were to say, OK, we're going to file um, all the way through getting a US patent on half of those. That's 200 per year. Um, that means we would have to allocate around $6 million per year for those patents. We simply don't have that kind of money. Uh, we try to make good judicious decisions when we file patents. But what we mostly do is we want the marketplace to speak to us. So when a patent comes in, um, let me see if I, uh, I'll get to the flow chart later on. But when a patent comes in, we market it. And we want the marketplace to, to come back to us to say, is there value here? And that mostly is, is dealt with by a potential licensee saying, we'll help pay with the patent costs. We'll reimburse your patent costs. So, but we have to ask that question 400 times a year. And sometimes the right answer is that expensive step of formally getting uh, patent rights is not the right way for this to move forward. And so that happens. And, and, and the limited budget that we have forces that um, uh, that question to be asked over and over again. And we look at things at how big is the market, um, who would be the potential licensees, would, you know, is, it, is it something that um, would, would end up in a product with a return on investment. So if you look at the across all universities, 
uh, there is a, a yearly survey that's produced where uh, universities you know, fill out a, a form and tell how they're performing. Um, and over 190 responded. And you look at the creation of IP. How many disclosures were created? How many patents were issued? How many startups? And you normalize that to the research dollars. You start to see rates of creation of the IP. So you can expect at a university about every two and a half million of research funding will result in an invention disclosure. Every 12 million in research funding, you can expect that, that university to, to have an issued patent that year. Every 90 million of research funding, you would expect a startup to be produced. This is what happens when you normalize the numbers out of the survey uh, and see how this creation, this engine is working. If you look at what industry's rates are, if you say, you know, a dollar for dollar comparison, our research support is like IBM's R&D spending, you're going to see a higher rate of patent creation. Industry is different than the university. Industry is not spending a lot of time having students uh, go through the graduation process. Um, and, and when I looked at this uh, uh, six or eight years ago, it was roughly a, a six-time, uh, six-fold increase in the issued patent creation by industry. But they're built to do that. Uh, we are built to do research, academics, public service. That's the core UC mission. And so you see universities you know, doing what they can. This is, this is the current rate that we see. When we get to what we do here at TTO, we are the ones who receive the invention disclosure. Somebody has an idea. They've written it on the back of a napkin. Maybe they call us up and talk, talk to us about it. We ask them to fill out uh, a more extensive form so that we have more information to, to give over to the attorneys. Um, and, uh, and then we work with the law firms to uh, prosecute the patent. We'll work with potential licensees to try to license that. We're also transferring tangible materials, whether it's to companies uh, or to uh, other nonprofits. We're giving talks like this. We give a talk uh, at the library about how to search the patent databases. Um, we do pizzas and patents in various departments. Uh, and so, you know, in our office, we're, we're having that flow of uh, IP uh, come through us, and we're dealing with it through that part of the supply chain from basically creating the inventor creates the IP, they're filling out our form, and then we're trying to take it through into the patent process and get it into the hands of the company for commercialization. And here's the flow chart of all the different activities that we're doing. Disclosures come in, we're going to evaluate it, we're going to market it, we're going to initiate our patent strategy. As it goes through the, the, the timeline, the market will speak to us, and some of those inventions will not make it all the way to either patent creation or licensing, but some of them do, and some of them do bring a return to the university. In FY 2012, we had 481 new inventions reported. We have an active portfolio of over 2,600 innovations. And again, that end goal of seeing products result. We've had over 230 commercial products introduced um, from uh, licensed technology. We're always looking at how to do our job better. One of our recent innovations um, in tech transfers, if, if you want to call it that, is our new Express license. You can find them on our website. It's basically a pre-negotiated license that a licensee would apply for. You would not, you, there no need for negotiations. You submit your business plan. We have a committee that reviews it, and 30 days later, um, you can be licensed. That's that's um, intended to accelerate startups who don't want to spend a lot of time negotiating and hemming and hawing over contracts terms uh, early in their founding. So here are some of the numbers, and you can see the growth in uh, our disclosures. As research funding increases, uh, you expect the disclosure rate to increase. And here we see that um, reaching into our FY12 uh, numbers. FY13 numbers will be out. Um, hopefully soon, hopefully uh, within the next uh, few months. Going on to that next stage where we have patent applications filed and patents issued. Again, you see sort of the increase, um, again, with research funding. You have to be careful with these particular numbers because it's, it's asynchronous. A patent filed today will not result in a patent issued today. 
there's a delay of uh, anywhere from three to seven years uh, on that. So uh, if you look at the FY12 numbers of patents issued, they may have been filed five or six years earlier. And then here are our licensees. All across uh, the world, here's the flow that we're talking about of the uh, innovations. Most of them are here in the US. In fact, most of them are here in uh, uh, San Diego. Uh, on our website, we have a nice map which shows um, California and the licensees within California, the United States, all those licensees. I decided to show the entire world here. Um, but as you can expect, tech transfer is very much a local phenomenon. It's very early stage technology. And so somebody from, let's say, the state of Maine, is going to be a big barrier for them to learn and understand and gain trust in the innovation coming all the way to San Diego. But if you can just have lunch with the inventor, that's, there's a very low barrier there. So we do many of our uh, licenses here in town. So you know, again, these are kind of the facts on the ground. Uh, from our fact page, we've had over 48 biotech companies formed with licensed UCSD technology, over 30 licenses to wireless or wireless-related companies. As I said, over 200 products have reached the marketplace. We have over 100 repeat licensees. So we're very focused on getting that disclosure and then seeing it in the hands of a licensee who can then productize it. There's our website. And so I invite you to, if you have any questions, um, send us an email, visit our website, and take a look at uh, some of the additional information we have there. We'll hold you to the end, and we'll have some time for Oh, yeah, we do have a question. <laughs> So um, we're going to be moving on to our next speaker now, um, Dr. Ramesh Rao, um, who many of you know. Uh, Dr. Rao has been a faculty member at UC San Diego since 1984 and director of the Qualcomm Institute since 2001. He also holds the Qualcomm Endowed Chair in Telecommunications and Information Technologies in the Jacobs School of Engineering at UCSD and is a member of the school's Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. Um, prior to the Qualcomm Institute, Professor Rao was also director of uh, UCSD's Center for Wireless Communications. He's involved on a day-to-day -day basis with a wide variety of research initiatives at Qualcomm Institute. Uh, he leads several major interdisciplinary and collaborative projects and has been a PI on dozens of federal, state, foundation, and industry-funded grants. Um, Dr. Rao is an IEEE Fellow and Senior Fellow of the California Council on Science and Technology. Uh, among his most recent uh, honors and distinctions, he received a 2011 Casa Familia Abrazzo Award, is that right? Um, for engagement with underprivileged areas of San Diego. He also was named a member of the Rady Children's Hospital and Health Center Board IT Task Force, member of the Board of Advisors of ComNexus, member of the UCSD Health System Advisory Board. <laughs> he's, he's, let me say he's very busy, so we appreciate that he's here to talk with us today. <laughs> so it's a pleasure to welcome you to this event. I think uh, we have a wide-ranging set of issues uh, to go over here today, uh, but I thought I would bear a little bit of witness to how this particular institution plays into this larger ecosystem. Uh, as perhaps most of you in the room know, we were set up back in the year 2000 with an explicit mandate uh, to focus on innovation, science and innovation. We're one of four institutes uh, for uh, Governor Gray Davis Institute for Science and Innovation. And that gave us a little bit of room for experimenting. Uh, looking back, uh, I think the most important things that we did uh, that perhaps uh, has enabled innovation here and the creation of IP and so on and so forth is the openness of the environment. Uh, we've been very welcoming. We are inside the university, so when we talk about being open, we mean open to other parts of the university, as well as the local industry. Uh, that enabled uh, researchers from multiple different uh, disciplines, as well as in industry uh, engineers, to spend time, coexist here, uh, and, and uh, follow uh, you know, where the ideas take them. If I, uh, we periodically go through our uh, sort of various reviews, and uh, most recently our tenure review uh, forced us to compile, uh, Jerry is here, uh, and can attest to the voluminous work that uh, Larry and the whole team put together. 
uh, to compile information, we found that we had generated 644 disclosures, uh, 69 patents that had issued, 99 licenses, and 29 startups. Uh, if you had asked me back in 2000 if you would have generated this level, I would have said probably not. I was looking at Bill Decker's data. I think uh, we stand out against the national average in terms of the number of startups. So it seems like we are biased more towards startups. Uh, <clears throat> to be honest, I don't think uh, I would want to take any credit uh, for engineering any of this. I think if there is a lesson from our experience here, it is to let things happen and not over-engineer uh, uh, the creation of intellectual property. That's really what has taken place. Uh, and the best way in which I could uh, explain this uh, is by illustrating with an example, which is uh, unfortunately very topical. Uh, Flight 370, Malaysian Air, as you know, has not yet been spotted. And I don't know how many of you uh, were following the story about this social media platform, crowdsourcing, uh, called Tomnod. Rory remembers Tomnod. So let me tell you the story of how Tomnod came to be. They were uh, three students from electrical and computer engineering, each one of them working on a completely different topic with a completely different professor. Uh, Nate, Shay, Luke, who happened to have space in this building to work with their professors on their various projects. They ran into this young man who had gotten his PhD and had no place to stay. You heard the story perhaps before, Albert Lin. He had just finished his PhD in material science just across the quad. One thing led to another, and they embarked on this really crazy adventure uh, where they went looking for Chinggis Khan's tomb in northern Mongolia. And since they didn't have any money in the pocket, the only way to do it was to talk a digital globe at the time, I think, into sharing satellite imagery, talking National Geographic into serving it up through their website uh, so they could get about 2.4 million users in all, tag these maps indicating where they thought Chinggis Khan's tomb might be buried by just looking at the topographical artifacts. And it's an amazing story. You ought to uh, hear it from Albert himself. They actually find it. You know, I think we are officially not allowed to say that. Uh, but then what did they do, talking about innovation? They went into Evo Nexus, uh, which is a sort of a remarkable undertaking here, and set up a commercial company called Tomnod. Uh, and this is the best part. Tomnod got bought up by Digital Globe. No IP. They never disclosed anything to anybody when they were at the university, nor did they disclose anything after they became Tomnod. They got bought up by Digital Globe because they wanted to get out of the satellite business and get into the services business. Instead of selling maps, they wanted to sell services. It's a remarkable story. Uh, so Tomnod recently launched, uh, uh, you know, after the Flight 370 went missing, uh, they cranked up and they provided maps. One and a half million hits per hour. Right? People from all over the world attempting to help in the search for the debris. Right? The system is down. You can't get in and you know, uh, do any more tagging. Uh, it's an example of something that you know, nobody could have anticipated. Uh, people found each other not because there was any explicit design by design. Uh, so I think this is where the university is at its best. I think once you go commercial, there are other factors that are important that we ought to look at. But I think we, I personally believe, are at our best when we let things happen. And we only let it happen for a finite period of time. No one is here forever. They graduate and they move on and they need to make a living and make themselves useful. So I was intrigued uh, when Jane was introducing Bill, he, uh, she pointed out that he had uh, his doctoral work in nonlinear dynamics. Right? I think that's what goes on here, nonlinear dynamics. And uh, now we'll go on to the third speaker on our panel, uh, Alan Kramer. So Alan has over 29 years of experience in a wide range of technology-based fields. At Northrop Electronics, he was director of software engineering for the MX Missile Guidance System. Following Northrop, he joined AST Research as EVP of Engineering, responsible for the team that developed the highly successful premium line of PCs as well as the ESA bus which obsoleted IBM's microchannel. In 1993, he joined with one of the founders of AST to start SRS Labs, a branded audio technology company that licensed audio signal processing technology to virtually every consumer electronics manufacturer. 
Uh, Allen obtained over 25 patents in the field of audio signal processing and created the multi-dimensional audio initiative for channel-free object-based audio. And most recently, Alan has joined Come Here, a licensee of UCSD technology as CTO at EVP Software. Uh, Alan. Thank you, Jane, and good afternoon. You can tell two things from that biography. One is I'm, I'm old. <laughs> And, and the other is that I walked out of my university in 1973 and zoomed into industry and never looked back. So it's really quite surprising and pleasantly surprising to be back at a university after 41 years. Um, and it will explain how that, I'll explain a little bit more about how all that came about. <clears throat> I'm going to talk about three things. One is what, what is COM here? Well, we're a startup company. I'll explain what, what, we're, tr what we're doing, what we're attempting to do. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the relationship that we have with uh, here at UCSD, and then uh, I'll make some observations about IP, which I think uh, some will merge a little bit with what Mark was talking about earlier. So if I can find the button, there it is. So one slide, very simple, but not simple. We're an audio technology company, but we're, we're not just making audio, we're not just playing music. We're looking at how people interact with audio, both physically and perceptually. And actually, that's something that I've been doing for many, many years in studying the psychoacoustics of audio. In most cases, audio ends at the speaker. And the engineer says, this is a good speaker. The amplifier has flat frequency responses, low distortion, and that's it. I've never looked at it that way. I've always looked at it. Audio ends in the brain and looked at the whole system. The ear brain system is part of the audio reproduction system. And, and most of my patents, uh, I think, I forget what number Jane used, but whatever they were, 25, 26 patents, are in that area of psychoacoustics and audio signal processing. Um, but now we're, we're also investigating how people physically interact with audio. They wear audio. I mean, one of the most obvious things is wearing headsets. Um, most people have big problems with headsets as they exist today, especially in the ear. They, they fall out, they're uncomfortable. Uh, they don't sound very good. And so uh, we've developed uh, a proprietary uh, biodegradable foam technology that we call EarPuff. That's what happens when you have a woman for a CEO. She names the things like that. <laughs> um, but it's actually catching on quite well. That is very comfortable, forms a very good seal to the ear, uh, prevents the falling out. And uh, by engineering the shape of the foam, you can actually change the audio characteristics to create very high quality uh, audio performance. Along with that, I developed a, a new audio signal processor from, from ground zero that we call CAP, or Kinetic Audio Processing, which enhances the, uh, the overall audio experience when you're wearing headphones and gets the sound out of your head and it just makes it sound like you're actually in the concert hall or the, or the uh, original acoustic environment. Won't go into too much detail on that. That's a whole other presentation. Um, We've also merged and bought another company from New York called Play Button that makes another form of wearable audio, which is just a little music player that you can wear. Um, and it can be branded. Uh, it can be a promotional thing. It can be the artist on it. It was actually invented by somebody that was going to concerts <clears throat> and uh, realized that people weren't buying music. They were buying t-shirts. They liked to represent who they were hearing at the concert or they had been at the concert. I said, well, why don't we combine it? Because these days, music is not physical anymore. Everybody's downloading it. It's just sort of vaporware. And it was a concept to make physical media again for the distribution of music. Uh, and that was going quite well. And it looked like something that merged very, very well with, with our kind of philosophy of personal and wearable audio. So we merged with that company in New York. The last category, my beam, is how we originally got involved with UCSD. And I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So um, we're actually kind of a guinea pig. And we said, well, we've talked to Bill and, and others about uh, how IP can effectively and efficiently migrate from a university into, uh, into the marketplace, into industry. And we said, well, we're interested in working on a project together. So. Since we're a startup and we didn't have any place to stay, 
why don't we come and co-locate on the university campus for a while? And that's exactly what we did. In fact, uh, at the moment, we're located just on the next floor. And um, why did we do that? Because we saw this really great synergy between the university people and the students here and old guys like me <laughs> that, could, that could create a great balance and, and some really exciting things that we were maybe not necessarily able to do ourselves. In fact, um, we've already started to write some new patent disclosures, and we filed the provisional patent last week. So we're moving right along in the, on the intellectual property side. Um, and we decided, you know, with the, with the experience that, that myself and others had in our organization with the, um, the audio industry and being out there for so many years, combined with the research that was being done here, to jointly sit down and research this together could be a very exciting opportunity. Um, there's also a lot of uh, passion. Well, audio and music people tend to have passion anyway, but uh, there's a lot of passion and excitement here on campus that, that we wanted to uh, participate in and take advantage of. Um, we work with Bill to license uh, one of the key patents in the area that we're working on, and uh, we actually are in a position to be sort of the master licensor for that technology which kind of plays right into my experience because SRS Labs, I think Jane mentioned, uh, I was there for 18 years as CTO, but the last four years I also ran the legal department, and our whole company was built on licensing of IP. Not IP that we acquired elsewhere, but IP that we actually developed ourselves. So a lot of experience in licensing IP and generating revenue from that. Uh, and then obviously we want to commercialize and bring the university IP or joint IP that we develop together to market as quickly as possible because we're a startup and we need money. <laughs> um, so the current work, the specific work that we're doing, uh, Sonic Arts, uh, uh, which is part of Cal IT2, has sound vendor technology, which is audio beaming technology where you can take an array of speakers. You can think about it, it's kind of the audio version of phased array radar and you can direct audio beams to different locations within a room. And we saw some pretty interesting applications for that combined with some of our uh, software technology and, and management technology in the areas of telepresence. For example, right now when you have a, a conference uh, and you put a conference phone in the middle of a conference table and you have people from all over the world coming in, everybody comes out of that one little hole in the middle of the table. And the idea of do, what we're working on is uh, what we call spatial interactive telepresence, where we can identify the speakers and we can array them around you in, in three-dimensional space. And now you can tell you somebody's talking from here and from here, and especially if you don't know the people and you don't know their voices, you can very quickly identify who's speaking just by the uh, auditory cues. We're also looking at gaming applications, entertainment applications, and navigation and uh, threat warning systems. Uh, I know in, in my car there's various speakers and you get beeps and boops and things if you get too close to various uh, obstacles and those beeps come from a particular direction. Well, using this technology, you can just put an array right in front of the driver and project navigation instructions and those beeps and boops all over in three-dimensional space and you get a real specific idea of where the threat is coming from or whether you're supposed to make a right turn or a left turn. So it's very exciting and uh, the more we work interactively with uh, the people here, um, the, the, the ideas are just flowing and flowing and flowing and kind of building on themselves. So the concept of being co-located, I think Bill said it's, it's better to license locally because it's more difficult if somebody has to come in from Maine to sit down with the inventor. Uh, we don't have to come in from Maine, we just walk around the corner and, and sit down in the person's office. So uh, that's working so far so good. Uh, probably the only complaint that we have is parking. <laughs> which is, <laughs> which is a, a challenge here. One of the, one of the uh, Peter Otto, who's the head of Sonic Arts, he's, he told me, uh, we were going out to lunch the other day and he said, I'm not sure this is a university. I think this is actually a big parking operation. <laughs> so um, on the next slide, um, I'm not an attorney. I don't even play one on TV. But I spent a lot of time in the field of intellectual property uh, licensing, as I mentioned. And I just thought I'd put together a couple of personal observations on IP, some of which may overlap. Uh, 
I think Mark was operating at a kind of a more meta level, a global level. I'm kind of down in the trenches here. Um, but, but the thing is, IP, a lot of people don't think of it this way. I mean, they think of it, but not consciously. It's a financial asset. It's like money. It's like money in a safe. And it should be treated like money or a stock certificate or something. I mean, this, this is worth money and should be protected like money. It can't be just left lying around on a table because somebody will just snap it right up. It can't be stored on a non-encrypted server <laughs> because somebody will hack into it and, and take it away. Um, it, think about it as you know, your online bank account. It needs to be as protected as that. And there's intrinsic value to patents. But the interesting thing is a lot of people think, oh, we've got to file a patent right away before we talk to these people. And, and they create this false sense of security. Um, I like to say patents really don't have, there's no security at all. Patents are for negotiation between people of goodwill. If, you're, if, people, if it's not people of goodwill and people are out to steal something, they'll steal it. And it is non-trivial to defend a patent. I never think of a patent as a defensive object. I mean, that's what traditionally was. We get a patent, we're protected, we're clean, we've got this walled thing around us. There's, a, there's patent law, but unlike civil law or criminal law, the police don't come after people that violate your patents. It's up to you and your attorneys and your money and a lot of your money to defend a patent. And that is, a, that is a pretty serious thing to get in there. And it's not easy to prove infringement, and it's not easy to uh, get a jury to understand the details and the technology of what you're defending. So I don't think of patents as defensive at all. I think of patents as licensable, monetizable entities among people of goodwill. Um, obviously, if there's blatant infringement or someone is stealing things and it, and it happens to be all under the right situation, uh, you can defend a patent and should defend a patent. But nobody should think that, you know, just if we're protected, as we're protected by the police or the fire department, there is no protection. And you can go to the, to the, uh, to the um, agencies and say, we won't let them, we won't let people uh, import these devices if they continue to infringe. You can get injunctions, you can do a lot of different things. But if you're small or, or even a university and you have a limited budget, it's not worth it. It's almost impossible. And even if you're big, like Apple, I'd like to see how much money Apple and Samsung have made out of these lawsuits versus their law firms. Forget about it. The people that are making the money are the lawyers, not Apple and Samsung. Um, and then the other side of IP, which is a pet peeve of mine, is the, the bottom feeders, the, the trolls. It can be very seriously abused. I'm sure everybody's heard of patent trolls. I mean, these are the guys that go out and find dormant patents uh, that are still in existence that they have nothing to do with inventing, they probably don't even understand, and then they go out and start hitting people at random and say, you're, you're violating this patent. Uh, fortunately, I personally was only the subject of this once, and we had one of the best IP firms in the country just shut it down so fast they didn't know what hit them. But these guys cause a lot of problems in the field of intellectual property, and I think there really needs to be some changes in patent law. To, to prevent this sort of behavior. Um, in larger companies, most IP is not effectively monetized. The companies are busy building the products, which is great because that creates value. But they have treasure troves of IP that potentially could be cross-licensed or used in other areas that could create in money intrinsically by the value of the patents and the value of the IP. So then we talk a little bit about theft, and, uh, and I was really interested in Mark's theory of flow because that's when it move, when the patent moves, that's when the money's generated. And one, one possible vector of flow, of course, is theft. <laughs> I think you, I know you mentioned that. Um, there's a couple of ways that we always avoided it. I mean, practical ways. You have to be very careful with pre-filing documents and conversations. You have to identify things as confidential. Don't let emails just go flying back and forth discussing the invention and putting in documents that people can that are copied. You know, that no one should be copied that doesn't have to be copied, because the more people that get copied, the more these things can can get out. 
and if there's any kind of disclosure, uh, and can it can be proved that there's a disclosure, you lose your opportunity to even file a patent. Um, one of the things that we're doing as a startup, because my previous company was all IP licensing, so we weren't building products. But one of the things that we're doing is taking the products that I just described and we're bringing all the designs. For example, the play button that I mentioned earlier was designed, built, everything in China, and the play button people had no idea where it was designed, what chips it used, where the chips came from. Well, you're just basically leaving yourself open to, to, uh, to theft. So what we're doing now that we own that company is bringing all the designs back under our roof. We're doing all the designs here and then possibly outsourcing the manufacturing uh, if necessary. But we're gaining control of all that, and I think that's very important. Um, and then the other thing is to build relationships. If you're going to offshore things, if you're going to outsource things, build strong relationships. Uh, at SRS, we were very, very reluctant to license any of our technology in China at all for many, many years, and we had a policy where we insisted on bundling the royalties with the chips. So if they bought a chip to implement our technology, the chip manufacturer had to collect and submit the royalty to us. That was, that was kind of restricting our business in China. So we decided to bite the bullet, and we, we, uh, we opened some offices in China, and we got our people over there to start building relationships and, and build, believe it or not, in China, trust relationships. And we were able to, to then license in the normal way, collect royalties from the Chinese manufacturers, and, and ended up being very successful. With this new company, um, we actually, the manufacturers, one of the biggest manufacturers in China is working with us and has actually invested in our new company. So that's a nice way to get his, get handcuffs on him because I don't think he's going to steal from somebody that he's invested in. <laughs> so the relationships, I think, are, are really, really important. Um, one of the other things I wanted to mention before I close about patents is that uh, it's not always the best idea to file a patent because uh, going back to this theft thing, um, it might, it's sometimes it's better to just keep things as trade secrets because as you file, uh, the applications are published. I think it's a six-month period, and then the applications are published. And, and then if you get a patent, the patent is published. So people can go pick and choose and go through those patents. Um, they can be worded in clever ways so that, you know, you're supposed to be able to make it so a routineer in the art could implement from the patent, but you can always do things to have, keep a little secret sauce back. But still, if you have a major trade secret and you file a patent and these documents get published, you can spark a lot of people in a lot of places getting ideas about how they can work around the patent and how they can create similar or and, and competitive technology. So I just wanted to close with, you know, in, these, in this world and these days of, uh, of uh, the, the wealthiest people being hedge fund managers that just shuffle paper back and forth. I mean, when you talk about the collapse of the economy, I think that's, that's one of the fundamental causes because you have those people are creating no value whatsoever. So I've, I firmly believe that, that IP is the only true source of value creation, and that's what drives the economy. That's where value comes from. People moving paper back and forth are a lot different from somebody taking some sand off a beach and making a semiconductor with it. And that's what drives the economy. That's what drives growth. And, and that's what keeps us everything going. Thank you. So I'd like to thank all our speakers for their um, interesting thoughts. And I'd particularly like them to thank them all for keeping within the allotted time frame, um, which uh, isn't always easy to get people to do when they have so much uh, interesting uh, subject matter to discuss. So we have time for questions. And um, uh, so if, if anyone in the audience has questions, uh, we'd appreciate hearing them. I think there is a, I see a, a microphone up there. Um, and if you could state your um, name and affiliation, uh, that would be appreciated. Is it, is it, okay, question down here. <laughs> I'm Don Kimball, CTO of Maccentric. I'm also a part-time researcher and lab manager here at, at CalIT2. 
So I have a question on the, let's say, the old UC Discovery Grant, UC Micros, which sort of disappeared. Part of the problem is none of the money there could be used to file a patent, or the money that was available, which was a small fraction, was unre was had to be used for other things. And so we had to rely on tech transfer to you know try to sell the thing and, and get somebody, let's say, like Nokia, interested in doing it, which is time consuming. Is there going to be a new grant that's going to come in from California, now the budget's getting better, where we can set aside something for generating patents? Because these are like twelve dollars to $15,000 a piece, I think. Uh, you know, and I know sometimes you know, we, we, we've wanted to, and we have to convince tech transfer, we have to get a customer, and it's too time consuming, but we say we really want to patent this. Anything like that? Bill. It sounds like a bill topic. <laughs> yeah. Well, there's, uh, there's a lot of focus on exactly that uh, uh, question up at UCOP and how the money flows within tech transfer, um, how that money flow occurs, and whether there's reinvesting occurring. Because in our policy, uh, the net revenue that we get is all distributed. It's distributed to the inventors, it's distributed to research, it's distributed to certain campus and central funds. None of it comes back directly uh, to feed the, the patent fund. Um, and so uh, it's a topic for conversation. I don't know of any grants that where you can put uh, a line item in the budget for patent funds, unfortunately. Uh, but I know there is an effort uh, to, to try to direct more money into tech transfer type infrastructure, including um, funding more patents. So it's not, it's not done yet. It's recognized as a problem, but it's not, um, they haven't redirected the money flows yet. Well, I, I can't guarantee, I, I cannot predict the future. If there's one thing I've learned working here for over 10 years, I cannot predict the future. <laughs> So maybe I'll ask a question while you're thinking. While you're thinking, I, I did see a couple up here, but but um, Ramesh, uh, just to sort of in association with um, what Alan talked about in terms of a synergy between companies and researchers, did, did you want to talk at all about the uh, innovation space that you that you have yes. here? Yes, yes, I meant to. Thank you for uh, prompting me. Uh, uh, we've been recently able to secure all the appropriate permissions that were needed uh, to make it possible for uh, non-UC uh, entities uh, to be co-located here with us. Uh, this doesn't actually result in changing any of the prevailing policies on how I, you know, uh, expectations on disclosures of IP or licensing and so on and so forth, but it just makes it possible for people to be physically co-located. So we have a a uh, small amount of space initially right here in this building that uh, is available uh, for suitable partners. We have a process in place and uh, uh, it's just come together so we haven't been able to go public with it, uh, but we are hoping that uh, we'll be able to generate new partnerships, uh, not only with startups but also national labs and so on uh, in this context. Thank you. There's a question down here. The topic of this session is the, uh, the role of research universities in defining, protecting, and innovating. And Alan and Mark today both spoke of the, the core problem here, which is that protecting a patent, defending a patent, is now an, an, a prohibitively expensive process for an early stage company. Uh, it's, you're talking not just about the cost of filing the patent, but the cost of, of, of funding a re-examination, of, of, of litigating the patent. And this turns into, well, lit litigating the patent alone is between three and five million per side. Um, if we throw in then a uh, re-examination of the patent, that's another year and a half, that's another three to five million per side. It's, out, uh, it's beyond the reach of small companies to fund the defense of this, of their own intellectual property, uh, which they may well have licensed from UCSD. Is there anything that the university can do to make particularly the small licensee, the small company, better able to defend the products and the innovation that they build on the licenses that they obtain from you. I recognize that there may not be the money, but is there anything that the university can do to assist in defending uh, a patent when there's an obvious, um, obviously uh, wrong uh, infraction of the patent by some other company? And if we could just ask your name and affiliation, please. Uh, sure, I'm Franz Berkner, and I work with Eva Nexus, the incubator here in San Diego. Bill, over to you. <laughs> so um, the way we work with our startups uh, is if there's some infringing activity suspected, 
Uh, we talk to each other. There's a, a quiet time where we try to confer as to what to do. We always try to find a business solution because that's the least expensive solution for everybody. I mean, as, as Alan was saying, and that's a solution where the lawyers don't get wealthy and, and everybody finds a win-win. The difficult thing is what happens if the, the only endpoint is that expensive litigation? Um, because the company has the, the most at risk, it's its products that are being infringed upon, uh, the university uh, has to basically work with the company. And we, I think we have a good track record of working with the company to make sure the issue is resolved. I don't think we have a, a, a large fund to, to fund litigation. The university is not built to, to sue people. But um, you, basically what we try and do is, is work together to find a business solution, uh, a not very expensive uh, solution to the problem, whether it's sublicensing or, or some other business deal. Larry Smarr. Um, so Alan, uh, I am um, struck by the happiness uh, that you exhibit uh, in dealing with uh, the University of California, San Diego, and its tech transfer office. Uh, out in the community. You want me and Bill to leave now? So <laughs> there, <laughs> he's, he's turning red. Out, out, out in the community, you often hear about how difficult it is and, um, you know, why doesn't UCSD clean up its act and so forth? And yet, here we have a really nice success story, and not only in the smooth check transfer, but then uh, actually doing something that isn't been done that much, actually allowing you onto the campus to, to mingle with the innovators and so forth. Uh, and that's a, that's a very good story. I'd just like you to say a little bit more about about that, I don't want to put words in your mouth too much, but I mean, it, it is really impressive to listen to. Well, um, I have to be honest, uh, having not really interacted with the university for all those years, I was like a member of the community. I'm going, what, what do we want to do this for? <laughs> Why would we want to do this? Um, not really knowing any better. And uh, it was through a series of uh, interactions with people like Peter Otto and Bill and others here at, uh, at Cal IT2 and just seeing the, the skill levels and the, uh, the intelligence of the students and what they could contribute and some of the postgraduate people um, that I started to get really excited. I said, well, wait a minute, this is, this is not you know, my preconceived notion of a university or life on a university or how you interact with these people. And we started over time about I would say probably a six month period uh, to develop a really close relationship, a real comfortable relationship. And um, I'm actually personally uh, surprised myself about how comfortable I am on the campus and with the people here. Um, in many ways, uh, obviously I was pretty comfortable at 18 years as one of the founders and CTO of SRES Labs, but you know, this is a completely different environment. You would expect it to be more alien and more kind of upsetting, but not at all. It's, I said, like I said, the only problem is parking. <laughs> um, uh, but it, it's really been great and very, very productive. And uh, I just feel fortunate that we had the, uh, the opportunity to, to do this. I, I, I actually was the one that um, introduced uh, our CEO and myself. We were kind of on our own when we were getting this started, and I introduced her to the people at UCSD. She was. Uh, she began her career in, in academia, so she was very comfortable and very enthusiastic about it. And of course, at first I thought she was crazy, and now I realize she was right. It's, it's a real pleasure to be here and a pleasure to work with the people here. Hi, Charles Gillespie, a founder of Semantic Research, which is a defense and intelligence analytics company, software company here in San Diego. Um, I was struck by Ramesh's comment about just letting things happen because I really think that is how innovation happens. You know, ideas just sort of percolate. But I'm curious about the uh, <clears throat> the notion of ownership of intellectual property in the university center uh, setting. You know, kind of understand if if the innovation is the product of a, a professor, an employee of the university, that the university has an ownership stake in that uh, intellectual property. But curious about the dynamic for um, student-led innovation. 
you know, does the university claim any kind of ownership of that intellectual property? How do you deal with transfers of that kind of intellectual property? Yeah, so we get, um, we get invention disclosures from undergrads, and uh, the, this is the way I kind of hold it in my head. We have employees here at the university, um, and they're conducting research. And then we have customers, which are those students who are paying tuition and going to classes and, and such. And customers are very different than uh, employees. So the university will, and is required to by the federal government, uh, have an agreement in place with its employees, with people who use the research funds and facilities. If you have students who are taking classes, like we have a number of design classes, um, senior design classes, where companies come in, present a project, and the students work on it. And, and in those cases, uh, you know, the students aren't in those areas I mentioned, uh, and so they're working out their own uh, interaction with the company. And we assist those classes uh, in, for example, uh, proposing how to, how to set up a CDA and, and things like that. We give them a little bit of advice, but it's mainly the, the student experience with the company. We also have situations where in those courses, the professor is also a named inventor. Now, in those situations, what we do is we sit down with the students and say, okay, we have something that's joint with uh, the university through the professor and then uh, also all of the individual students. And we say, we, we, we talk to them and say, look, if you want, we can consolidate all the rights with the university and we would treat you as a university inventor. But it's their choice. But, I, you know, we try and persuade them that one licensor is more commercially advantageous than, say, five or six, each walking off on their own. And, and I think in nearly every case, they've decided to, to turn it over to the university and, and let us do the licensing. But if it's just the students, um, it's part of the student experience, and, and uh, uh, they're our customers, not our employees. Donna. Oh, this one right yeah, there. I've got there. the microphone Sorry, right here. I apologize. <laughs> the microphone. <laughs> uh, my name is Jeff Hudson. I'm the CEO of Venify. We're a cybersecurity software company. So my perspective is that the bad guys want to steal the IP, the bits and bytes themselves. And they're not interested in how it's protected or how it's licensed in patents or statutorily. And Ramesh, you brought up a really good point about openness, collaboration, let it flow, let it happen. Very open environment is a university. So how do you think about the actual physical theft of the intellectual property by the non-inventing countries? Uh, because a lot of the primary research that's being done here ends up as ones and zeros and can get exfiltrated and used by somebody else, notwithstanding all the great work that's done on the licensing and patents. How do you think about that? What's the, how do you hold that in your mind, to use one of the phrases Bill just used? about the open environment? Yeah, it's a tough one. I, I don't have a simple answer. Uh, this is surely not going to satisfy you, but we do have researchers who study cyber theft, measures uh, to detect this and countermeasures uh, so you know it doesn't go on. But that is a research pursuit of its own. Um, we do come under the legal protections, and there, are, there have been instances where our systems have been compromised, and you know there are investigations that we hear of sometimes. Uh, uh, that attempt to track down. Uh, uh, but to be honest, I, 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 this is now speaking uh, ent entirely on behalf of myself, I think this is a sort of a permissive environment. The four years a student spends in a university is a training for the rest of their life, right? This environment is not going to be as buttoned down as you know a work environment that they might go on to. So I think we will never look like the commercial world. Uh, and I think we just have to recognize that and, you know, be clever about what kinds of projects we sponsor, how we frame them so, you know, we don't open ourselves up in the wrong way. So I can add to that. I mean, our experience being here is it's not just the ones and zeros. There are physical products that we're working on. And uh, the doors are open to this building, as far as I know, all the time, uh, which is something that, you know, in the commercial world is never the case. You have security. You have people in the front uh, desk letting people in and out, you're signing in and out. And when people come into a commercial company, they can only go to certain parts. They can't go to where the, you know, your, your secrets are. So 
we also have to work on it on the physical aspects of it and uh, it's not that difficult we just have to be cognizant of it we make sure that you know if we have things we don't want people to see they're put behind a locked door and and uh, even though the building's open they can't get in through that locked door um, so I mean that permissive environment kind of extends not only to the to the cyber part of things but also to the physical parts of things and you know maybe some of those analogies would apply to the I mean you would know better you have a that kind of a company but maybe that kind of analogy would apply where you can compartmentalize things and you can encrypt things that that are deemed critical to try to protect them as much as as physically possible quick, quick one uh, quick question or response to, to Larry Smar uh, I think one of the fundamental issues about the relationship between the community and UCSD is a, an inventory of the ongoing research. I know that in a number of discussions I've had with the university, understanding the scope and specifics about uh, ongoing research projects at the university is a challenge. And I don't think that's a, something that is unique from the outside. I think it's also inside. Uh, I'm Bruce Roberts, retired from Cubic and uh, founder of the Cybersecurity Institute of San Diego, which is emerging. And one of the things that I would really like to address is that if you go back to ARPANET, one of the founding principles was anonymity. And yet, when you talk about cybersecurity, one of the founding challenges is identification and non-repudiation. And those two are diametrically opposed. And somewhere in the middle, we have to come up with an intersection. And I think the challenge is much greater uh, in the academic area where there is significantly greater emphasis on individual uh, uh, privacy and uh, opportunity than when you're talking about an industry where there may be constraints imposed by the corporation and the policies. So I don't know how you address that exchange in the university environment between the individual's right to anonymity or independence and the issues are faced with trying to protect information on the net or in the inner in the network um, so uh, I can think of kind of two disparate examples one is the we face that type of issue of personally identifiable information mostly uh, out of the medical school in terms of patient data. Patient information is, is of great interest to uh, pharmaceutical companies. They want to know how their drugs are doing and, and such. And so we have to be very careful when we pass patient data over and try to monetize that, um, that we protect the anonymity of the patient. In terms of cybersecurity, I mean, it's, we get, we get inquiries uh, from all over the world. Uh, I've had inquiries for high-performance computing software from Iran. Um, you saw on the chart we have licensees in, in China. We have a new technology out of one of the labs here on, on how to strip the personally identifiable information from um, video that's used to track motion. And it's, it's, it's an interesting technology, and I think it's very hot right now. I think um, it, it would be uh, very interesting as we try to market it, uh, who's interested in it. That's, that is research going on at the university. And so it comes into our office, and um, we've been much more aware, I think, in the last year or so with the addition of an export control officer on on technologies that may be of interest to countries that have an organized program of, of theft. It's a complex question. How do, I, how do I manage this technology that could be used both in a legitimate consumer area, but could also have a use that is detrimental uh, to what particular government agencies are trying to do? So I, I don't know if I have a good answer for wh what you're saying. These are the questions that we are faced with, and they're rather complex questions. And they arise from being an op in an open university where anybody can research anything. Um, so I probably didn't answer the question at all, but 
we, fa we, we face the problem. So I, I don't know. It, Well, our, our office, I mean, we get visited by certain federal agencies that are, have police power and, and are interested in these questions, and they, and they try to raise our awareness because all, all of the technology is flowing through us. So we become an easy contact point uh, for um, what they're trying to do, which is to keep track of, well, what's the latest technology that people want to steal? Well, first you've got to find the latest technology. We've got it all up on our website. So I'm, I'm going to have to cut this interesting discussion off here, but I know that there's a, a sort of networking event at the end of the day, so perhaps uh, people can pick up their other questions then. And I'd like to thank the panelists again um, for their contributions to this session. Thank you. So thank you, Jane, and uh, to the panelists. I. Um, neglected my role in introducing Jane before she skips out of here. She is the Assistant Vice Chancellor for Tech Transfer uh, here at UC San Diego uh, and as oversees all that you heard about. But I wanted you to know that for 12 years she was a strategine here, uh, a company uh, in uh, San Diego, and uh, got her uh, Bachelor of Science and PhDs and University College London in a field very dear to my heart, microbiology. And Jane, we need to have some discussions about the bugs uh, later. <laughs> so thanks so much, Jane, for your help. And um, I'm gonna be chairing the uh, next uh, panel. And so um, if we could get our panelists to come up. Um, so let's see, Rory, you're here. Okay, great, perfect, okay. And I think we're chasing down our dean, and so, <laughs> Al Pizzotto, so I'm sure he'll get here, but uh, we'll uh, put him last, how about that? And I didn't introduce myself, I guess. Uh, I'm Larry Smar, I'm a professor in computer science and engineering uh, here at UC San Diego and the founding director of the California Institute for Telecommunications and Information Technology, of which this is the UCSD division, the Qualcomm Institute. Um, so uh, we're going to really look now at this intermediate level, having got all this defined intellectual property, how does that both get into startups, good to see you here, uh, but also, um, how do you train professors in um, becoming entrepreneurs and working in the business sector? And that's a big job and something that we've been fortunate to have connect uh, here with us. And then how do you incubate? We talked a little bit about some of the beginning of incubation here uh, in uh, the Qualcomm Institute, uh, but there's a real incubator that uh, Rory is gonna talk about. So Rupika, why don't you come up um, um, so, Rupert ben, um, Butler, so um, he's the Vice President for business, business Creation and Development at Connect. Uh, and Connect goes back to, uh, for quite a few years here, uh, and is, one, is copied all over the world as a way to uh, get from ideas out into uh, the uh, marketplace and um, I'm sure you're gonna tell us about uh, the springboard programs and many, many other ones. Um, uh, but you have been engaged in being a chief executive uh, in your prior life. And so he has a, a great deal of ex experience as well as uh, what he's doing now to help us all um, become better entrepreneurs. Thank you, Larry. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, did we get the presentation? Somehow, anybody? Okay. What, what presentation is it? Um, is it? The Connect Overview. Yeah, the third one. No, no, down, 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 down. 
Nope, not that one. That's the wrong one. That's the wrong presentation. I could be wrong. No. No. One, one down. That one. Yes. Thank you. Perfect. All right. All right. So, uh, yeah, thank you for the opportunity to talk a little bit about uh, Connect. Um, Connect was formed in 1985 uh, to really help San Diego's economy to become more diversified. It was founded, among others, by Dick Atkinson um, who, from UCSD. And actually was formed within USD as a, as a really a, an entrepreneurship education program. And the mission really was uh, clearly defined as reaching into the university, reaching into research institutions, uh, and uh, really identify uh, technologies that are compelling and uh, help educate those that would commercialize those technologies uh, to uh, build uh, licensable products or viable businesses and then uh, worked really hard to connect them with capital. And uh, so in 2004, um, Connect was spun out of USD, became an independent nonprofit organization. And you can see here on that slide the various areas that we are focusing on. Front and center is business creation. Uh, business creation in the sense that uh, we want to help innovators out of the universities, uh, but also entrepreneurs in the community uh, to develop scalable business models, compelling go-to-market strategies, as well as financials that uh, uh, can uh, be attractive to investors. And in this process is really a, a creation of value uh, that starts with a concept and then becomes at some point something that actually can be protected and licensed and uh, can uh, create value in the product. Uh, access to capital is, is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have. Um, capital in San Diego uh, has been scarce in terms of venture capital, but there's a lot of grant funding, uh, particularly in the life science areas, to really start to create value for early stage discoveries. Uh, there is a, a, a healthy angel uh, capital investment here in San Diego and uh, also very much corporate investment. So. We haven't done too badly, as you will see later. Uh, front and center is also uh, our educational curriculum. We have uh, various programs that, after we basically make entrepreneurs and their projects look pretty, educate them how they can uh, uh, deal with investors and actually procure funding. Um, another aspect uh, that's important for Connect is the support and the growth of new industry clusters. So we. Uh, when you look at the, the history of San Diego, you have a, a life science industry, and then you had a, a very strong wireless IT industry. Those two started to converge, and uh, what you have now is very strong growing uh, mobile health type of technologies. We recognized that uh, pretty early on and incubated the Wireless Life Science Alliance with InConnect and spun that out a few years ago. Um, so we're, we keep looking for areas where Connect can help not only entrepreneurs but also new industry clusters as such to, to, uh, to grow. Uh, one other thing that has become very important, uh, particularly also when it comes to IP, uh, is that policies matter. Um, we uh, were able to, about four or five years ago, to open up an uh, office in Washington, D.C. Uh, to essentially uh, take the policy interests of our stakeholders, of our members, of our entrepreneurs, uh, directly to Washington, D.C. There is a uh, vice president of policy that is in Washington, D.C. that carries those, uh, those, those initiatives forward to uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate. So front and center of our business creation is the Springboard program. Springboard uh, was conceived uh, by Bill Otterson, uh, the first CEO of uh, Connect in 1993 and has evolved uh, from there. It is a program that uh, helps innovators and entrepreneurs create those scalable business models, 
marketing plans and financials. It is supported by a large number of uh, mentors, and this is where, we, where the key and the, uh, the lifeblood of the program is. Uh, those are CEOs um, that understand the challenges of creating new businesses, um, that they are supported by a great number of uh, marketing and uh, CFO resources to help entrepreneurs to build up a, a mentoring team that really delivers a high quality investor pitch that opens, uh, the, the, uh, uh, opens up the doors for investors. We're very fortunate that we have uh, mentors really from all, uh, all of the uh, industry clusters, very strong life science team, strong uh, in software and uh, digital media, but also in, uh, uh, life, in uh, uh, clean technologies, sports innovation, and consumer products. So <clears throat> the type of companies that come to us really start with the, uh, 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 with the scientific uh, researcher, the professor in the lab. Uh, we've been working with UCSD uh, uh, innovators uh, certainly since I came uh, in 2005 to this program um, to really help them understand uh, uh, whether they're ready or not to commercialize and, and uh, if so, is this something that can be a licensing deal where you don't have to create the infrastructure, the expensive infrastructure for a company or is this a technology platform that really can support the creation of a new company and then spin that out. Um, this is really uh, the target of, uh, uh, of the mission of Connect to really um, advance those type of conversations with researchers. Uh, we've been making progress with UCSD. We have a strong relationship with SDSU and develop a relationship with researchers uh, from Spay Wars and uh, uh, among the 80 or so research institutions here in, in, uh, in San Diego. Uh, the second category is actually working with companies that are uh, brought to us from the tech, uh, technology transfer offices to help accelerate their uh, entry in, into in, introduction to industry. This is often case a, uh, uh, of interest to, to corporate investors, uh, life science companies like Pfizer and Merck uh, take a look at what's coming out of uh, those technology transfer areas. However, what we probably work most with is this third category. This is the commercialization category. Uh, it's a first time entrepreneur that uh, really takes advantage of the experience and expertise of the mentors that we bring to them. Um, they really start from scratch. They typically have a technology or scientific uh, discovery and bring that to a proof of concept and then build business plans around it that allow them to eventually raise money to uh, validate their business model and to start growing. Uh, we have a fourth category that's for uh, entrepreneurs who have done that before. They're fast tracked through this process and we get them ready for to raise capital. And then uh, very importantly, uh, Connect uh, has, uh, has been recreated in more than 50 different markets. So uh, we're looking to help companies that come from Asia, from uh, uh, Europe, or from Latin America to come to the U.S. to enter this market via the gateway of San Diego, which uh, adds to our diversity here in the, in the, in the uh, industry. So what these companies typically work on always starts with an assessment. Uh, the first panel is really to take a look at uh, what and how far this business has been developed. Uh, and then uh, makes a match with a mentor, um, the CEO-level CEO mentors that look at uh, uh, whether this uh, entrepreneur truly understands who the ideal customers are, how they can, can transact with that customer, how they build scalable business models, and then when they're ready, uh, they uh, go to a panel of uh, senior marketing executives um, that look at uh, uh, the market segmentation, uh, differentiation, and go to market strategies, and recruit, recruit one of those marketing mentors into the program to build this up, and uh, we repeat this a little bit further downstream uh, with a panel of CFOs to look at uh, how well the business plan assumptions are uh, represented in their financial models, they audit the financial models, 
and very uh, importantly decide and, and conclude from a cash flow analysis where the true value inflection points in the growth of this company and uh, how much money does it take to reach those milestones, which dictates then uh, where the, uh, the money is going to be raised from, typically from uh, friends and families, or friends and fools first, and then angels, and then maybe venture capital later on. Throughout the process, uh, we look at those long-term sustainable advantages that this company has and how to protect that, and that is really where uh, IP is generated, um, not necessarily only patents. Uh, we look very carefully whether it may be uh, a better uh, case is made for copyrights or trademarks or industry secret. S secrets really depending on where this company is. Uh, you know the discussion on, on software IP, uh, there's a big difference to what happens in the life science area where we talk about composition of matter patents versus process patents. Uh, in that, we rely uh, on our relationship with uh, law firms here in San Diego, both on the IP and then on the corporate side, that really help these companies to uh, create intellectual property uh, strategies um, that uh, basically build a fence around their competitive advantages that they can grow over time, and with this, grow the valuation of their, of their, of their company. We teach them how to create due diligence records so that once they are through the springboard process, they are ready to sit down with potential investors and disclose what they have and uh, hopefully come to a deal. The last point and the last uh, aspect of the springboard program is uh, the final panel, which is a very important aspect because we reach out uh, outside of the ecosystem of Connect and the springboard program and reach out to investors. Uh, potential strategic partners and uh, industry experts to listen to a 15-minute presentation, uh, engage in uh, active question and answers for about 35 to 45 minutes to really find out uh, where the gaps, where the blind spots are, and anything that needs to be worked on, and then to provide feedback to that entrepreneur and uh, if possible, establish relationships that gets this uh, company to another level. Um, every uh, six months, we reach out to our Springboard graduates, which uh, since, three, uh, since 2005 has exceeded 350 companies. Uh, we found out that uh, more than 65% of these companies uh, are still alive and operating. Uh, this is a process of, of uh, often uh, talking to the CEOs and the founders of these companies and uh, finding other ways to establish where they are. Uh, they also report that more than half of them have raised money uh, and the last period uh, for the first time uh, broke through that uh, $1 billion in capital raised. Um, one big uh, aspect of this last period was Eco ATM, um, that uh, company that makes little kiosk where you can put your old cell phone in and get money back, um, which is a very great story because it's all uh, the value of this company was all uh, all created in San, in the San Diego County. They went through our uh, capital competition. Um, they formed an alliance with uh, two outsourcers. Uh, DD Studios to do the design of that kiosk in Carlsbad, and DNK Engineering and uh, and Rancho Bernardo, who did the prototyping, the engineering, and the manufacturing. Uh, they got a strategic investment from Coinstar, um, and then uh, were acquired by Outer Wall uh, last year for 350 million, which is a great exit, uh, and great value established here in San Diego. Overall, um, I think 2013 uh, proved a better year. Uh, we're just about ready to uh, issue our next impact report and have determined that in 2013, companies raised close to $150 million, and that doesn't count the $350 million of exit value that was created through Eco ATM. Uh, you can see there on the right the composition of our portfolio companies. Uh, it's a, a large number of software companies that uh, are quick to establish, don't need a lot of funding to, in order to uh, bring product to market and create value, uh, about 25% life science, and the rest then in uh, clean tech, sports innovation, wireless health, et cetera. 
So the lifeblood of this program are our mentors, um, our, our business advisors that have CEO level experiences and can bring that experience to those new entrepreneurs, but also to um, professors and universities that want to step out and uh, commercialize their discoveries. Um, they are, those mentors are uh, really part of Connect, not only the Springboard program, they are judges in our capital competitions and, uh, and the most innovative part awards program that we run. Uh, importantly, also, they assist uh, the UCSD entrepreneurs comp uh, competition and help mentor them and get them ready. Uh, and so they're really part of the community, which really keeps them involved and keeps, keeps those uh, mentors here in San Diego, which is, uh, which is uh, crucial. Uh, and then we have uh, about 450 of those domain experts in marketing, finance, engineering, supply chain management that can round out those teams. This is all I have, and I want to thank you for your attention. Well, it's uh, my pleasure to uh, introduce Dean Alfazano. Uh, he is a recent uh, UCSD uh, recruit from UC Berkeley. Uh, he is a longtime innovator, uh, member of the National Academy of Engineering, a great MIMS expert. Uh, but the thing that uh, has really bought, brought to the uh, campus here is his long experience in uh, being a serial entrepreneur and starting up uh, quite a few companies. And so uh, it was really great that he could carve out some time um, from his insane schedule to come and uh, spend it with us here and talk about from that experience what he sees as we move forward uh, the role of IP in, in the university. Hey, Larry, thanks a lot. I really appreciate the intro. And indeed, the schedule may be insane, but I'm not. And I'm not going to have any view graphs. So what I'm going to do for, I'm sorry? That's for the next, next speaker. So a good entrepreneur sets you up for what's next. Well, what's next is Rory. All right, so here's the deal. Uh, so uh, thanks, Larry, for the intro. And indeed, uh, I spent 30 years at UC Berkeley. Uh, while I was there, I built and ran the largest industrial consortium for research on that campus ever in history, and it still is the largest and longest running one, 48 companies at its peak. Uh, then the Lehman crisis came along and it treated us down to 26. I built it up to 36 again, so I crossed 36 twice. And then the wonderful opportunity down here, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's, you got it, right. Yeah, once on the way down, I wasn't counting that one. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so I was a 36-member company, three uh, member consortium, three times on the way up, down, and one more. Uh, uh, and then uh, had the wonderful opportunity to come down here. So I'm very happy to speak to this group. The other thing I want to say in self-introduction is, indeed, uh, I've got 10 startups to my uh, track record and uh, sold one to Qualcomm. Uh, and uh, hey, we're still friends, so I guess that was a successful exit for me and a successful entrance for the company into Qualcomm. Uh, and the quick joke I'll tell is, you know, sometimes an entrepreneurial exit is a life-changing event. Sometimes it's a house-changing event. Sometimes it's a car-changing event. And if you don't lose your shirt, maybe it's just a shoe-changing event. Well, I got a car-changing event out of my exit, and I did good. All right, so here's, uh, so let me get to the academic uh, aspects of the IP and all that. You know, the old academic mission used to be, hey, we'll take some people, we'll train them up. Maybe the curriculum is heavy on the fundamentals. And then uh, we'll toss them and, some, uh, them and some research papers through the transom. Anyone know what a transom is? Has anyone here seen a transom? Right, OK, so that was the age test. We won't mention what the, so I actually remember transom. So you would, the transom is the vent window it used to be over the door. And if you leave it open, then someone could toss something in the room and split uh, without you knowing who it was. So the old model was, oh, well, you know, we'll train up a few people, make up a few research papers, and we'll sort of toss that through the transom and get on our way. And we all know that doesn't work. So the new academic model, as I see it, is the following. Uh, we train people, 
in the fundamentals. We make them practice engineering. We then, as undergrad, starting as undergraduates, and we have some of the we have some of the perpetrators of this mission right here in the audience. Good. Um, uh, we then train them how to be entrepreneurs as undergraduates. We have a special program by which, if you dot the I's and cross the T's, the undergraduates can own the IP. Then we help them start a company. And then, since we've got guys like Rory who says, hey, man, I'm next, on the li I'm next in line, we toss them out as entrepreneurs with an idea and a research vision. And new in the last six months is that we have a $5 million early investment fund to help them along. But everyone here knows, because we're all gurus, that's nothing. Up in Bay Area parlance, you'd need a backing fund behind that. So we help uh, with the help of uh, a Bay Area entrepreneur who we're recruiting out of Sierra Ventures. Uh, we have a $50 million backing fund to that. So all of a sudden, it's starting to look serious now. And indeed, the academic mission is now shifting. What you do now is send entrepreneurs out who will prosecute that technology vision, which has been oriented correctly to the market and uh, the commercializing side. So uh, a lot of that has been happening in the last few months. And I won't get into a, get into a lengthy uh, discussion about that. But I want to point out now that to keep something like that going, that's my number one job. And we're not just working on the IEP. And indeed, uh, we have very good relations with uh, the IP people on campus. And I don't know if uh, Jane Moores is still in the audience here with us. Yeah. OK. Well, it wasn't me. She didn't leave because she knew I was coming. Um, the real point is that we have very good relations with her. And indeed, uh, she was. Uh, she's one of the conspirators in getting these new relaxed policies in place so that we actually become the university that spawns the companies. And if you look on the university level pages, you will see that now as one of our important functions. So the, the new model needs to be kept alive. So how do you keep the new model alive? Well, you know, you need a pipeline and some reforms. So the pipeline is now, the new pipeline is, Young people in, entrepreneurs out. That's what we're doing. And the reform, and the ref or even let's just say young people in, companies out. That even sounds better. All right? That looks like a real, to me, that sounds like a good product. I've lived that life a little bit, and I tell you, it's a, it's a very important thing to do. And I recognize some very important entrepreneurs here in the audience, and I think uh, you can have some eloquent words to say about that. The important thing is that you need some reforms so that we can prosecute this mission to the fullest, right? You don't want to trip up uh, this wonderful new mission if you're not, not correctly aligned. So uh, one, of the, one of the earliest big changes put in on this campus happened some years ago, and that's Qualcomm Institute. And I think Larry uh, and the team that uh, he built to do that, Ramesh Rao, I see up there, uh, these guys have created a special environment in which multidisciplinary uh, collaboration, unencumbered by a lot of IP trip wires, uh, can be made so that these young people can work with older people and actually come up with these ideas. That's really great. And you notice in all of these sub-themes, there's the, and if you relax the IP policy, you know, the flowers start blooming. And so that's, that'll keep coming up in the next two minutes of my presentation. The other thing is that you have to start, uh, so you have to start institutionalizing this. And uh, we're not ready to uh, have a grand announcement yet. But let's just say that uh, what if the engineering school were to partner with uh, uh, Cal I, uh, Qualcomm Institute, engage deeply the School of Management, and stand up something you might call the Institute for the Global Entrepreneur. Now imagine, and of course I'll use these as standard weasel words because I spent two and a half years in the federal government and did not get sued, incarcerated, or sent to China. And no, I don't know uh, who Snowden is and never had any words with him. Uh, the real point is that imagine in a few months I might announce that we have put together a center that overnight has 40 to 60 entrepreneur coaches, overnight 
is putting 300 students, I mean, like from the day we stand it up, uh, is putting 300 students into industry for internships so they understand how the commercial world, commercial world works. Imagine on the day it's opened, uh, you have uh, eight staff to make sure this is organized. Imagine on the day it's open, you've got a $5 million and a $50 million backing fund. Imagine on the day it's opened, you have a series of programs that basically uh, not only assist, but show the way for young people who really want to be entrepreneurs. Imagine that we stand up an institute like that that spans the campus the way I'm saying it, and imagine in the year after that, you open it for even larger engagement. So I can't guarantee that's going to happen, but let's just say that's something that's becoming quite real. And imagine now the uh, liberalized, uh, progressive IP policies that this school is moving forward, that this university is, is adopting. And imagine we put all that together as a feeder into the environment around us. So uh, imagine then an institute that is founded on the principle of having people practice entrepreneurism, maybe even before they get their baccalaureate degree. I think that's going to be a ginormous force uh, for many, many positive things. And uh, some of you here are looking at me nervously like, how much of it is he going to leak because I'm involved in this? And don't worry, I'm not going to go any further. But that's my, and don't chuckle so they'll know who you are. Uh, but that means, hi, this is imminently getting very, very, very real. So I am very much looking forward to an, a very exciting future. Uh, this campus is going to partner with high school so that you keep those people coming in. We're going to be partnering with the incubators and all the other wonderful resources. Connect. Rory, you're going to talk about Evo Nexus and a visited Rory's shop already. Wonderful place. Imagine Rory doesn't have to say anymore, gosh, I wish someone had tweaked them up a little bit before they came here because I don't want to do everything remedial. Don't worry. We're going to be taking care of that here. So let me end it there. Uh, I don't want to go over uh, time limit, and I just want to then put forward the vision. Imagine a liberalized IP policy not standing alone, but fully integrated into a full front push in the right direction with all the right people trying to do all the right things. That is what I think you're going to be seeing coming off this campus in the next, let's say, uh, 12 to 18 months. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Dean. Um, and let's uh, go back and get that Evo Nexus homepage up on the screen. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to introduce now Rory uh, Moore, who uh, I've worked with essentially since I came here in 2000. <laughs> and um, Rory is really an extraordinary human being. You know, he's not only co founder of a major company here, Peregrine, which we're going to hear from uh, Ron Reedy in, in the next uh, session, uh, and, and several others as well. Uh, but he has then uh, most recently founded Evo Nexus, which he's going to tell you about. Um, and just, you know, is a huge uh, energy source, a military special interest group, uh, uh, next stage committee, um, on and on. But the thing that really amazes me as a um, high kinetic energy risk avoiding person is, is in addition to angel investing, he's in a competitive aerobatic flying, often in planes he makes himself, scuba diving, surfing, in other words, the perfect Southern Californian. So Rory? introduction. Well, first of all, let me uh, blame somebody in the audience for being here in, in San Diego, and that's Ron Reedy. When we started Peregrine in 1990, myself, uh, Dr. Reedy, Dr. Mark Berger, both alums of UCSD, the three of us took a vote of where the company would be. At the time, I was living in Phoenix. So I got outvoted. <laughs> but I had a boat here in Harbor Island, so I got a chance to be a liveaboard. Uh, Al, I want to correct one thing you had in your talk here. You talked about life-changing events, uh, new home, new car, new shoes. 
you forgot new wife. Because <laughs> that, that sometimes happens. And um, so uh, being an entrepreneur uh, certainly uh, brings a lot of downside. Uh, I remember a, a particular instance where we just started Peregrine, Ron Reedy, not Mark and I were sitting in this little hole in the wall office on Point Loma. And uh, my do divorce was coming through the fax machine. A fax machine before the internet, right? So no, so Ron is over there, and he's, the fax paper's coming out, and this is the property settlement. It was 19 pages of things that my soon-to-be ex-wife was gonna get, and the very last page was what I got. So Ron said something like, well, you get a chance to start your life all over again. So um, that's what happens. But um, uh, Peregrine uh, really uh, formed uh, my second life, quite honestly. I was happily um, uh, making a lot of money in Phoenix, Arizona, although I'm a California native. I know there's a lot of money in startups because I put it here and lost it, uh, but I've made some along the way. But without Ron uh, convincing me to come to California and, and helping him start Peregrine, I wouldn't be here today. I'd be very wealthy in Scottsdale, Arizona. Okay, um, so uh, we also learned something, uh, Ron and I, along the way, is when you make a presentation, often the best presentation is the fewest slides. And uh, you start out as an entrepreneur with about 50 or 60 slides, you think more slides are better, and you find out very quickly that it really comes down just to a couple slides in your presentation. And Ron and I were up, up at Intel many years ago presenting to the Intel Components Research Group. I remember, you know, Ron, you probably remember the story. So Ron's up there with 40 slides, and the head of Components Research uh, says, bullshit. We know we got a problem, how can you solve it? So Ron went to one slide. And that's all we talked about, the rest of the time was one slide. So um, we've got it down to one slide at Evo Nexus, and there it is. And it's great when you can put it on one slide, the results, I don't know if you can see that in the back, Franz, you're getting kind of old, can you see it back there? Okay, good. So again, this started in, in 2009 an incubator in San Diego. There have been some accelerators and other things start in San Diego. We've had Springboard and Connect, but there really wasn't a true incubator, although the Silicon Valley had incubators for some time, uh, Plug and Play, Y Combinator, Techstars, and there was a lot of things going on around the country. But the rest of the country didn't have the problems we have. When I say problems, we have a handicap here, and that is there's no big banking center here, there's no big venture capital center here. Um, over the years, we haven't had as easy a time with the schools uh, transferring tech, uh, like Al up at Berkeley and the people at Stanford, which basically the VCs walked in, cut the deal, and took equity. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but it was much easier to do tech transfer at Stanford in early days. So uh, Admiral Davis and I came on Oh, I guess it was about 2009, so about 2007, we were drafted. We thought we had served, but we really hadn't finished our service. And uh, so I was in the Air Force for a while, a little bit, and the Admiral's in the Navy. And we joined ComNexus as volunteers, and in about 2007, uh, we started uh, giving more time to ComNexus. And then in 2009, you know, Lehman Brothers had blown up. Uh, mortgage crisis, it was just the end of the world. Uh, we saw terrific engineers uh, being laid off. We, we saw in what was unbelievable, even Qualcomm not able to give guidance for a couple of quarters. So it really was starting to look like the end of the world. And uh, so the Admiral and I were getting a little bored at ComNexus already. We decided what's more fun than starting one company, we'd start a bunch of them. And so we approached our board of directors, uh, Franz and Martha Dennis and others that are in this audience as well, and uh, came up with the idea of a totally pro bono incubator. Pro bono, free. We take no equity, no warrants, no fees, nothing from these companies. And it was going to be funded by the community. No government funds, corporate funds. And uh, we convinced uh, uh, a board of directors that uh, this is what should occur. 
they were very skeptical. Uh, we needed office space and a lot of other things, so it was up to the Admiral and I to get out there and hit the streets again and try to sell this idea. And um, we had uh, some early adopters that came along to support it. And as they say, the rest is history. They're the results. Uh, we've looked at over 700 companies that have entered the incub tried to enter the incubator. We admit less than one in 10. We've, had, we've raised over $520 million in capital for the companies, and we've actually been participated in that raise. When, when I say participate, we actually help them with access to capital and uh, an outcome. We've had seven acquisitions out of the incubator. Uh, currently, we created over 1,000 jobs in San Diego. And this uh, tech jobs are typically three to one. You create one tech job, you create three others. That's math that EDC likes to talk about, but we like to talk about kind of like real jobs. So when we create a company uh, and they hire and they use more vendors and more support, that adds more jobs, and those are real jobs. So um, we have two locations. We have one downtown at 101 Broadway next to the federal courthouse. That's the building on the right downtown. We have um, 14, 15,000 square feet there, Class A office space and UTC at Executive Square, the one on the left. And um, that one is also about 15,000 square feet, totally free, provided by the Irvine Company. And we, they pay the utilities. So how many of you here are familiar with the Irvine Company? Raise your hand. OK, quite a few. Uh, they are the largest private developer in the country owned by one man, Donald Bryn. And uh, the Donald, as we call him, um, came along and provided this, this office space. And um, we really changed the culture of the Irvine Company in the process. They are uh, looking for more ways to grow companies. They see the startups that, that go through ComNexus, through Connect, through other programs, through the incubator as their future. They know that in our lifetime, we'll probably not see another Qualcomm. Honestly, that's, I guess that's a little depressing to think about, but probably not, uh, nor more than there be another Intel in the Silicon Valley. But uh, we have to grow the future, and it's going to be the 100-person company, and it's going to be the mid-market companies. It's going to be the Entropics and the Peregrines and others that grow. So that's the future of San Diego. That's the future of Orange County. Uh, we can't fix venture capital. We can't bring more venture capitalists down here. They're not going to come down here. They're not going to open up an office down here from the valley. If they want to invest, they fly down. They look at a deal and they invest. Um, we'll have a few funds start up now and then, but that whole model is under great pressure, as everyone knows. So our companies here have to compete with the companies up in the valley and in Boston and other places. Our companies have to be further along to get the capital which means they've got to be beyond their PowerPoint or that one slide. They've got to have a prototype. They've got to have some customer traction. They've got to show that they're more than PowerPoints, and they will attract capital. The big, most serious problem we have here with capital is not venture capital. I want everyone to listen carefully. It's not venture capital. It's angel money. And I worked in the Valley for a couple of years. I had a couple companies up there I started. And uh, it's no exaggeration. You've had so much outcome in the Valley with high-tech entrepreneurs that have made $50, $100 million that don't just retire, go by their vineyard in Nava Valley and their ski resort and go off the grid. They get back in the game. It's unbelievable. They rank their fortune and take a few months off, and now they're at Starbucks with their buddies looking at deals. And they're not a member of Band of Angels or Tech Coast Angels. They have their own little organ, own little clubs, so to speak, not clubs, but the groups, and they're quietly investing in the Valley. So when you read in the papers that Kleiner or Sequoia or NEA led an A round with XYZ Company, what you don't see is that there was $3 million of angel money in it before it even made the papers. And that angel money was Peter Thiel, was Larry Andreessen, was smart money. And the smart money draws the institutional money. So San Diego has plenty of high net worth individuals here that have made their fortune in tech. We've got to get them off the sidelines. We've got to get them to invest in companies. And it doesn't take a lot. 
You're talking about a startup that half a million dollars of seed money is a lot of money. It really matters. So San Diego has been great as far as uh, high net worth people being philanthropic. And again, I'm going to be very unpopular when I say this, of building hospitals and museums and zoos. But that's not going to save San Diego. It's the new companies that will save San Diego and the new wealth that will be created here. So that's where I come from. It's uh, uh, get the capital off the sidelines. Everyone here knows somebody that should be investing. And uh, whether it's the companies going through Springboard or going through ComNexus, EvoNexus, get them off the sidelines. It's not a big check. Um, and there are plenty of people here that can write a $50,000 check and not have to call home and see if it's okay. So that's what we need to do. I'm proud of what we've done here at EvoNexus. Uh, it's just the beginning here in San Diego at EvoNexus. Um, the people that uh, I surround myself with, all the great volunteers like Martha and Franz and others here in the audience, are really ones, ones that make it happen. Uh, without them, we couldn't do it. Um, we don't have a big staff but we have a huge staff of volunteers. So thank you, everybody, and I'm open to questions when we can do that. If no one has one, I'm going to ask one which is how soon is anyone thinking of dying that they don't think they're going to see another big company like Qualcomm come along? I would, I'll, mm -hmm. uh, just for fun, we're already going to push back on that and say w if we, uh, we're talking we hundred, We're talking a $120 billion market cap company. I didn't say three significant digit like them. I said uh, like them. <laughs> <laughs> Speak up hard, louder. Yeah, just a second, Martha. We got a phone coming. I mean, a phone. Oh, yeah. microphone. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about changing the uh, IP policy of the university? Are sure. you going to do something magic? Uh, <laughs> Hope. Okay, so uh, 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 what I can say as the dean, not as the person who runs the IP uh, organization, is that uh, I think Jane Moores has her head screwed on straight, and she's trying to move uh, IP policy to be much more liberal so that we just basically uh, take more shots on goal and put more deals on the deck. Uh, I had a chance to talk to a friend who was uh, close to the action when the Google deal was signed to Stanford, the IP, and the, the word the guy gave me was, hey, you know, no one knew it was going to be anything. It was just yet another deal. You know, we did 10 that day and we were just, you know, pumping the paperwork through. So, uh, you know, so uh, Jane <laughs> understands that. And so a lot of this is, all right, look, can we just start just moving these things through? And uh, she's put through some reforms in her office so that the reward system is not based on doing one deal every five years that's worth $10 billion. How about if we do 100 deals a day, and then we'll see which ones go? So the university is moving in that direction. Shots on goal is now becoming uh, important. I'm encouraging from the sidelines. It'll take them a little bit longer to get there, but I think you know when you're on that track, then you know you're in the right direction, and it's only a matter of time. So that's what I can say about it. I mean, one of the things is that well, I get the microphone there that the UC system, all ten campuses, do have this um, common <coughs> intellectual property from the office of the president. However, there's a lot of leeway, and UC San Diego is actually normally thought of as the Wild West. Um, so if you want some problems, go to some of the other campuses. Uh, <laughs> but uh, I think having someone like Al, who's been at Berkeley and done all these companies, and then here is Dean of Engineering, where a quarter of the undergraduates are, um, uh, it really can make a difference. Hey, Larry, I'll tack a three words onto that. If you want problems, go to the other campuses. If you want solutions, come here. Yeah, um, Charles Gillespie again. So, um, so I founded and exited six different companies, um, and uh, I have a similar thing. I buy a car every time, you know, <laughs> and, and and once it was a leased Honda Accord, and you know, <laughs> once it was a uh, 2001 Honda MPV minivan, so I could move my family back from Manhattan. 
right after the dot com bomb. Okay. Um, but you know, having successfully exited a couple of companies, I'm wondering and seeing you know Connect and even Exus knowing them pretty well, and uh, you know some of the other startup kinds of. Uh, things that are happening in San Diego. It looks like that part of the, the ecosystem is starting to get pretty vibrant, pretty exciting. I'm wondering if there is something like that for folks who might be ready to start taking on a role as an angel. Um, do we have anything that sort of takes people who either made money someplace else or have made money in technology and says, okay, this is what it would take for you to become an angel, start to you know, feed this ecosystem from that side of the desk? I think, yeah, there's uh, the Tech Coast Angel, probably the largest uh, angel network uh, in the United States, spans from San Diego all the way up to Santa Barbara. And they pretty regularly uh, hold uh, seminars, uh, the art of angel investing. Uh, I've been through that and must say that it's very high quality. It talks about all the risks and rewards and all the little things that uh, uh, can be pitfalls in that process, but I think it serves as a, as a great recruiting tools for new angels. And uh, over the last years, uh, I think, and maybe Jay can chime in there, uh, there's been sort of a big, been a revival and uh, some new, new, uh, uh, new and younger angels coming in that uh, make things exciting. Uh, yeah, I, I'll echo what uh, Ruprecht said. Uh, Tech Coast Angels in San Diego is now uh, 110 members. Is that right, Martha? Something like that. A uh, lot of new blood in the last couple of years since the last uh, uh, financial unpleasantness. Uh, and uh, I think we're doing uh, in the neighborhood of uh, $20 million a year in investments, not all in new investments. Uh, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of young folks in the, in the uh, and Rory, by the way, I'm one of those investors who does uh, check with home before I write a check. <laughs> but then that's why I'm still married after 32 <laughs> years. So I want to uh, tag on to uh, the, the comment here, but uh, let's dodge the marital, is marital issues for a second. Uh, uh, which is, uh, I think I see Rosabelle in the, in the audience there. Just wave your hand. So I, I missed your name when you were saying, you know, getting in. Uh, also, I want you to direct your attention to the woman uh, 12 feet to your left. Uh, if uh, Imagine uh, you wanted to have an angel in training program where uh, you could put them in front of uh, uh, 30 or 40 uh, student-developed deals uh, and have them just even just exercise judgment about how to choose and all that sort of stuff. Uh, maybe, Rosabelle, you want to make a couple of comments about uh, your work at the Von Liebig Center? So actually, we run a program funded by the National Science Foundation called the ICOR, and we actually are training 30 teams of entrepreneurial teams per year for the next three, three years. And we are definitely looking for mentors, angels, that want to guide these teams um, through the process. And we have the 10 presentations tonight if you want to come. I think I would like to add something that in terms of the resources that are available, particularly also to university uh, um, researchers. There is a new game that's coming to town uh, that actually is going to unleash the donors to be able to invest directly into industry uh, and uh, UCSD research. Uh, Beta Funder is a portal uh, that's uh, basically a crowdfunding platform for donors that can directly invest in a uh, donor fund uh, that is managed and uh, is really controlled in, in a major way by UCSD in terms of directing investment into uh, researchers that are profiled on Beta Funder. Uh, they're working with UCSD and with Merrill Lynch and just uh, in terms of the opportunity through Merrill Lynch that could be somewhere around $33 billion that could be invested directly into research as a donation. And um, I think that would probably exceed what is being uh, given by government uh, funding in terms <coughs> of, of grants to universities in any given year. Okay, and one more, yeah, Bruce. 
Hi, I'm Bruce Bigelow. I'm the journalist in the crowd and moderator in the next session. I just wanted to make an observation, I guess. I agree completely that I think the angels in San Diego are the key to what uh, we're trying to accomplish in terms of innovation. Um, but in terms of my own personal experience, I, I wanted to um, create a slideshow of angel investors for the Xconomy website in San Diego that would help raise visibility of the, who they are and what kinds of deals they're investing in. And uh, it was like pulling teeth to get 20 of them to step into the light. Uh, and um, even when we sort of pledged that we wouldn't forward hecklers to <laughs> their doorstep. Um, but the thing that I noticed, there was a crowdfunding um, announcement that was made last week at the San Diego Venture Group uh, mm -hmm. breakfast. Um, there's a local guy, Jeff Belk, who is going to start directing uh, deals to an Israeli-based crowdfunding platform called Our Crowd. And Our Crowd says that they have 4,000 accredited investors who have registered through their website to look at and invest in deals. The thing that I thought was significant is that 150 of their registered investors are residents of San Diego County. So, um, you know, to me, the irony is they don't want to step into the light, but they are in San Diego. It's just a question of getting to them and trying to, part of the, I guess the, the point I want to make is that part of the, of the training, angel training, is to kind of condition <laughs> them to stepping into the light. This is a question for our Dean and Rory. We have the, the project classes like ECE 191, MAE 156B. I was wondering if perhaps, there, I think CSE and Structural Engineering, they all have one. You could entertain a grand prize, because I've sponsored many of these. And every once in a while, they, it's a team that sticks together and comes up with a really good idea. Let's say you give them their grand prize is a nine-month slot at Evo Nexus or something like that. You know, it's, it's like it doesn't have to be every single project class, but if someone could go around and look at all of them between the structural engineers and our mechanical engineers and our electrical engineers and, and say, here's a grand prize for, let's say, four or these teams of four that sometimes they come up with a really good idea. Uh, I was wondering if you'd entertain something like that because prizes seem to, to work. Well, uh, we actually have had some of those in the past rise above those contests and apply at Evo. Uh, we had a, uh, we recently admitted a company uh, called Electrozyme, uh, Ramesh, you know that company? Who's the professor that sponsored them? Joe? Wang. Wang. So this is a biometrics uh, startup, some PhDs, and uh, it was their first ever venture. Came out of UCSC like the guys at Tomnod and uh, got into the incubator and uh, actually doing really well. They're raising capital already. So we're always looking for those teams and uh, we, we, I think we would be very happy to provide a accelerated review. Uh, it's, we have uh, people like Martha and Franz on the committee and if, they, if something comes in that, through that door, they would certainly expedite that. Martha? Franz. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, so from the dean's point of view, uh, I think uh, uh, Roosevelt can make some auxiliary comments. I think we're all geared up to do that. It's just a case of making a connection. We have the machinery in place to do that, actually. Well, Roosevelt, did you want to just <coughs> re reaffirm? In the ecosystem, because we're talking about Evonexus, about Connect, about uh, Von Liebig, about Moxie. But at the end, if you look at it, it's a whole continuum where we start with a great idea and great teams and how do you put them through the pipeline. And Electrozyme, for example, Josh Wynn Miller, great idea, came through Von Liebig, funded, mentors, three mentors, and now it's, it, we're very happy that they are at Evonexus. So, and they're still going to, the, to be presenting to the Triton Fund. So it's a good example of how we all work, work, work together. You're right. Uh, they, even though it was their first venture, uh, they, they really uh, learned a lot there, and their presentations to our committee, which is a tough committee, went through very smoothly, and they were admitted in the first vote. So thank you. Martha. Yeah, I just wanted to 
say one thing, and that is that um, there are a lot of resources around for companies coming out of the university and elsewhere. Um, what isn't clear to them is what are the pathways and what resources to approach at what point in their existence. And this is something that maybe the university will take it up, um, but I've tried to do a matrix for the community. I think I presented it at Rosabelle's right. Um, but somebody needs to keep that up because there are new resources every day in this town. And uh, there has to be a way to get it out. I see we had one last question here. I just want to build on this motion that started that um, share with you. <coughs> 20 years ago when I was working for Motorola, and on those days, Motorola was r ruling the world. Uh, <laughs> one of the things that Motorola was giving award to the engineers was if you even submit a IP uh, patent, we give you $100. Just submit it uh, as a disclosure. And uh, obviously, if it becomes a patent and everything else, you get a few thousand dollars. So I want to encourage this even for UCSD. Uh, if we can, uh, sub, uh, for the professors and graduate students, if they become encouraged as some sort of a reward program to have to submit uh, patents and everything else, that will help them to, because this is always an obstacle in front of everybody's mind. Ah, yeah, I have this great idea. Mm, too lazy, or I don't know if I should do it or not. But if any kind of push or encouragement that helps them to go ahead and start submitting, and then with the support of the team, they can grow, that will help not also that person, but also the organization and university for the number of submissions. Okay, I think that's just about it for this session. <coughs> and I'll introduce Mike. Okay, thank you. I think, uh, David, why don't you come down here um, with Ron and Sujit. Just go ahead and sit on the front row right now because I think it's easier to see. And I'm going to introduce Bruce. So Bruce Bigelow was, is uh, somebody that I've worked with personally a lot, and uh, he's been a, uh, just a, a great uh, innovator in the whole journalism uh, sector here. He worked for a long time with the Union Tribune, and uh, but is now the uh, lead for San Diego and Exconomy, which as you know is a national uh, organization that really has become kind of the online voice of innovation uh, in many of the innovation uh, uh, cities and regions uh, around the country. So um, I'm gonna have Bruce uh, take over here and talk a little bit about how we grow uh, how does the global economy actually expand by both the invention and the protection of intellectual property? Bruce? I have no slides, uh, which is probably a good thing. Uh, I just thought I would, I'm the moderator, I think, of the uh, next panel. <clears throat> I hope you've got something to say, Dave. <laughs> Um, and uh, uh, I just thought I would briefly explain who I am. Um, <clears throat> I was uh, uh, at the San Diego Union Tribune for 18 years and sort of sensed uh, more than anything else that the wheels were coming off the newspaper industry and about the same time that I was approached by this startup that's based in Boston called Exconomy. And, um, the founder used to be the editor of Technology Review Magazine, which is affiliated with MIT. Uh, he had a core team that I was really impressed with. And his idea was to do something like um, <clears throat> uh, TechCrunch or VentureBeat, um, but to go into the um, sort of the secondary capitals. Like everything after Silicon Valley is a secondary capital of technology. Uh, and his idea was to go into the second tier um, uh, cities that have clusters, technology clusters, and to provide coverage 
uh, about innovation, um, very narrowly focused on innovation, but across the board. So we cover life sciences and technology and clean tech and everything else that comes up. Um, and uh, so I have really the experience of of leaving a company, joining a startup, uh, feeling like I found a lifeboat um, uh, from a sinking ship, and, uh, and then it started to feel kind of like life of pie because uh, there was a tiger in the other end of this lifeboat. <laughs> um, so uh, I just thought I would, s that, that's kind of my story, um, and um, I wanted to sort of bring us back. We, the last session, we talked quite a bit about innovation. There's a lot going on in San Diego. Um, the uh, sort of focus of this uh, session is on intellectual property. And um, I just thought I would mention two personal anecdotes. I don't have a lot of experience with intellectual property, but when I was in graduate school, uh, one of the um, uh, one of the fellows who was in the um, dorm room next to me uh, was from Singapore, and he would regale me with stories about how much fun it was uh, to take um, books that were published in the West and to reprint them in Singapore and sell them in Asia, and he was making lots of money, and it was great fun. Uh, and when lawyers for Random House or whatever um, confronted him, he, he basically uh, told them to get lost because he was in Singapore and they couldn't do anything about it. So that was one little example for, I think, for the copyright infringers or the patent infringers. Um, it can be really fun and if they have the right legal protections, there's not that much you can do about it. Um, the other is also personal. I was at a technology journalism conference in Irvine and September of 2000, um, and Erwin Jacobs of Qualcomm made a presentation to about 100 journalists in the audience uh, at a lectern kind of like this. And when he was done, there were a bunch of people that clustered up next to him to ask him questions and so forth, and Erwin stepped off the stage to talk to them. <laughs> and um, then when he turned around, his laptop was gone. And so I wrote this lead. I, I dug this out of our archives at the newspaper. September 17th, 2000, Qualcomm founder Erwin Jacobs' laptop computer disappeared during a conference yesterday in an apparent theft that could put some of the company's most sensitive secrets at risk. And to be honest, I don't know what the outcome of that story is because after that initial disclosure, Qualcomm, for some reason, didn't want to talk about it anymore. Um, so that's my scene setter. Um, that's, that was you know, almost 15 years ago, and um, things have only gotten more intense since then, I think, in terms of trying to pirate um, secrets, technology secrets. And um, I'm going to pick on Dave first and let him. I don't, you know, just come on up and. <laughs> <laughs> of the San Diego Entrepreneurial Absolutely. Investment Community. No, because we'd be here all night. Um, okay, so I'm supposed to talk. I thought we were going to just sit up here and pontificate on questions or something. So, so Larry asked me to talk, and the topic is wealth and intellectual property. And I come from a venture capital background for the five of you in the audience who don't know me already. Um, and, but the reality is, long ago, I started a company that has created a lot of wealth, not for me, but for a lot of other people, and it involves absolutely no intellectual property. No patents, no trademarks, well, I guess maybe the logo's trademark, but what the hell. No nothing. You could copy the business model, and in fact, that year, 14 people in the county copy had the exact same business model which was to start a bank. And ours happened to become more successful than the rest of them. But the point of this is really you have, in, in a fascinating article the other day, 
in the venture capital industry and this creation of wealth around intellectual property. 25 years ago, you did technology. And why did you do technology? Because that technology gave you a competitive barrier. And if you asked a venture capitalist 25 years ago, there are 100 of us, why they did technology, that would be a big answer. And today, you have this huge creation of wealth around projects that involve little to no intellectual property. If I gave most of you in this audience $25 million, you could in, what, a year have all the technology invo that involves Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, WhatsApp, Snapchat, Match.com, you name it. You could have all that from a technological standpoint in one year and $25 million. The, the intellectual property from a traditional, I have my name on a patent standpoint is not creating value there. But if we think about intellectual property as an intangible business asset and say, what are the other intangible business assets that people have and how do they create wealth and how, as, as Marx kind of gotten to it at SNS, you know, people are busy trying to steal them because that's what people do. We've been stealing stuff for millennium. And it used to be physical stuff. I wanted your land, I wanted your cow, I wanted your wife. And no, I won't go down the whole marital thing on that. But, um, you know, but we're mostly out of the business, unless your name's Putin, of stealing stuff, of physical stuff. We don't steal physical stuff. We don't go grab land. We don't grab cows. God knows. Okay, we don't grab wives. So, but we're, we're in the business of people trying to get your intellectual property. And so what does that do from a venture capital and wealth creation standpoint is that it, it makes, from an investor standpoint, intellectual property even harder to invest in. What Ron does, and I don't know what Ron's going to talk about, but what, what he does is hard. You can't do, how many transistors on a chip today? Peregrine. Yeah, a billion, you know? You can't do that. Two guys with, with 90 days and a quarter million dollars can't do a chip. A chip costs 80 to 100 million if you don't blow it. And so when, when you look and you say, Creating fundamental intellectual property is hard. It takes time, it takes money, it takes PhDs, rather than kids who drop out of San Jose State. Then you say, boy, that's hard. As an investor, it is less compelling to me. I'd much rather invest in something that can get 350 million users in the space of two years. And so this whole question of how we fund fundamental technology and innovation, because let's face it, are you all familiar with WhatsApp? Raise your hand if you're not. OK, you missed out on $19 billion. OK, but WhatsApp is not fundamentally innovative. It is an app that allows you to send a text message, OK? Even Peter Preuss can send a text message, I know. He doesn't, but I know he can, because he's a smart guy. And he created fundamental intellectual property, but it was hard. And so we have a real disconnect in the investment world today between what is valuable or what creates wealth rapidly and what is fundamental intellectual property. And to the extent you make it harder to capitalize upon intellectual property, it becomes even less attractive. You know, 
people who do hard things are always looking for ways to leverage. I, you know, get me a government grant, get me a customer, get me something. But if, if you make it such that I can't enter a market, which is another form of, of theft. I'm going off this because Mark wrote this great piece, and hopefully you all saw it. But, you know, if you can't, if you are Google and you're not allowed to enter China so that the Google equivalent in China that is owned by the Chinese government can, in fact, control that market. That's essentially theft of an intangible business asset, which is this concept of search that Google has promoted. You know, so um, I I think there there are some real questions about how we will fund and advance fundamental technology, and will we see a more great revolutions? People don't start semiconductor companies anymore. They truly don't. You know, um, we had, what was it, two years ago that Peregrine went public? Okay, so in a year we had Peregrine, Maxim, and Entropic Semiconductor here in San Diego all went public, created wealth, um, and there's not been a semiconductor company formed or funded here in San Diego, I don't know, maybe in 10 years? And it's not San Diego. It's not San Diego. It's, it's that it's, it's hard. That it costs $100 million. And, and so how are, the, how are you going to get true innovation, true next generation? You know, it's why, you know, at least in biotech, it's good. You have patents. You have regulations. You have... Um, it's harder to steal a, a drug than it is a piece of software. I mean, God knows every, every teenager knows how to steal software. Um, even if they knew how to steal a drug, they wouldn't know how to make it. I mean, some of them do, but not every one of them. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of interesting issues, and, and I won't claim to know the answer, but it's, it's to the extent we want to talk at all, Larry, about San Diego, it's really relevant because in San Diego, part of our ethos and pathos is we do hard things. We don't do well social media apps and Hollywood content and things like that. I mean, we're good if you want to shoot a movie here, but we don't have all the you know, other blah, blah. So in a community, a university that's doing hard things, what is going to be the path to generate wealth, because that's what drives things. I'm sorry, you know, it, it is what drives things. It's, uh, it's what drives the valley in spades, is the, the desire to create wealth. And so if, if we don't figure out how that can be created around fundamental innovation and intellectual property, uh, we will see a plateauing of that, and we will live in a land of apps. I'll end on that. You know, I did a poor job of introducing you, Dave. I'm sorry. Um, Dave is the head of the San Diego Venture Group in San Diego, and um, he's also the managing partner of um, Windward Ventures. Um, and um, I'm afraid, Ron, that my little screen just disappeared on your background, so it's going to be very short. <laughs> um, but I know uh, I've written about uh, Peregrine Semiconductor in San Diego, uh, and I can tell you that Ron was a researcher with the Navy on Point Loma and came up with a fundamentally different approach to chip design. And um, I think it was at a time when the Berlin Wall had fallen and the Navy was less interested in keeping these kinds of innovations in-house. <clears throat> and so uh, a dispensation was granted to start a company uh, based in San Diego called Peregrine Semiconductor, uh, where he was a founder and chief technology officer. Is that good enough, Ron? Thank you. There it is. Uh, th thanks for that incredibly accurate and 
So, uh, so Rory, Rory threw me under the bus by saying I dragged him over here and got him divorced. So under the, uh, the human equivalent of the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you cannot distort a system without being distorted back. So Rory turned me from, um, from, from a completely safe lifestyle into the alligator swamp of entrepreneurism. And he warned me, you'll never go back. He was right. So what Rory didn't tell you is uh, the reason he did that is he and I used to be, uh, students would be the wrong word, but we were, we were incredibly good friends. He, my father called Rory his seventh uh, child. And Rory's parents once told me, you know, you're a smart kid, you'll think of something someday. And when you do, if you want to start a company, you come to us, we'll put up the first money. So when I had figured out how to do this new class of technology, I called Rory and I said, we need to, I think we can start a company here. He said, I can get you $250,000 tomorrow morning. I said, Rory, this is the semiconductor business. That's more money than I ever imagined. But you and I need to talk because that's a drop in the bucket for what we're going to need. And Rory flew over, and uh, uh, we were we were um, co-founders uh, as soon as that was done. So it's uh, it's a mutual distortion society that we created on each other. So I want I did want to talk, um, kind of return back to the root of this meeting, which is intellectual property, and just make some observations, not necessarily conclusions. But first of all, I do have a I do have a theory of life, which is that information itself has no value except when it's in motion. The example is you actually know the cure for cancer. You, you never tell anybody. You never start a company. You don't issue a patent, which is intended to transfer that information. You don't actually do anything with that information, and then wham, a bus hits you. That information had no value because it never moved. So what patents and intellectual property are is actually a form of the motion of information that gives it the value. So that's the concept and the framework behind which I look at intellectual property. Uh, there are a few facts that I do want to uh, kind of mention, which is man has gone for about two to 4,000 years where essentially most of the wealth was in agriculture. Let's face it, the great, what was valuable, the Nile River, uh, France was the most powerful country in Europe. Why? Because they had the best farmland. Agriculture was the source of wealth and power until the Industrial Revolution came along. And then agriculture went from employing 70% of the U.S. population to today it employs about 2 or 3%. Industrialization reduced the value of agriculture. Why? Because industrialization added so much productivity to agriculture that you didn't need all those people. And that's why food's so cheap. So in the 18th and the 19th century, what happened was industrialization replaced agriculture and all of the disruptions to the normal society was underway. And that was everything from all the great wars in 1800s to the Marxist revolution was all caused by that one fundamental transformation. And then along came the famous information society. David Halberstam's book, The Reckoning, and those of you who haven't read it, I suggest you do. It's still instructive. It's the comparison of the Ford Motor Company to Nissan. And the Ford Motor Company actually went and did a study. When did the Ford Motor Company have more than 50% of its employees working on information as opposed to slopping solder and, and, and arc welding things? And the answer turned out to be 1952. 52. So that's the Ford Motor Company. That's big metal. That's, we were still belching smoke out of smokestacks in 1952, and Ford was half information. Designers, salespeople, uh, uh, people who created the styling, et cetera, designing the factories that did the, the, the factory building. So it was an astonishing, uh, to me, it was a real transformation, which says the information society is actually, we're, we've already passed through that. So what are we in now? And most of the examples today, in my opinion, from Tomnod to, uh, to, to, to Google, what we're in today is actually a combinatorial society. Google, the ultimate software company, is now, what did they buy? They bought a cell phone company. Well, they really bought an IP company and dumped the cell phones. 
Bill Gates was once said, I'll never make any hardware. Guess what Xbox is? So you're seeing more and more of these combinatorial things. The three guys that founded Tom Nod, they weren't three similar people. They actually were three different people that came together and out of that popped an idea. So what we're actually doing now is combining things. And the things we're combining, that is that very intellectual enterprise that Don was just talking about. It's that business philosophy. Tom Nod didn't invent anything. They didn't invent crowdfunding, and they didn't invent putting up satellite pictures on the internet. They came up with a new thing to do with that. So what's happening in the post-information age, and in my opinion, the post-industrial age? For those of you who missed it, Moore's Law is actually over. Uh, no, none less than Paul Samueli of, of Broadcom, a UCLA founding, uh, founder of Broadcom pointed out in his articles, and it's now, it's even in The Economist. The cost of transistors in the next note is actually going to go up, not down, first time ever. That was the first half of Moore's Law. They get twice as fast and half as, as expensive. So we're really running the, the gamut on, this, on the efficiency of manufacturing. And now the real question is, how do we combine these things? How do we put biotech with electronics and make little things that, that, that fix our body or to identify things. So all of that is a form of intellectual property I don't think we even have our hands around yet. The individual pieces will be protected by patents, but combinatorial things are going to be more uh, business knowledge and know-how than they are the core base IP. The other thing I did want to mention is the, 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 the intellectual property landscape is changing incredibly rapidly. Uh, in the, in, in, and one way of proving that is from 1950 to 2000, from 1950 to today, more than half of the Supreme Court cases, so that's a total of what is that, 64 years now, half of all the IP cases that the Supreme Court has taken have been in the last eight years. So in the previous six, 55 years, they took in, I think, around 20 cases. They've taken 24 since 2005. That tells you the impact of intellectual property. And some of these have been massively disruptive rulings on, on a variety of, of, of intellectual property. So what, what we're seeing is we're seeing things like patent trolls, uh, which I think a lot of people uh, are, are, are objecting to. But you're also seeing new business models that are a combination of patent trolls and law firms, frankly. Law firms are now staking half the cost of a lawsuit to Franz Point. They're too expensive. And Franz, if you can do three to five million, tell me how. Uh, they're more like 20 each side for, a, for a, a full, to take it all the way to conclusion. So the law firms are now becoming somewhat venture capitalists. And they're saying, look, we'll fund half of that, but we want venture capital rates. They literally apply a 30% IRR for the money that they put in, and that's the way people are going to have to fund these things because it's too expensive. So you're seeing these things evolve. Again, it's a bit of a combinatorial, uh, combinatorial approach to things. So the last thing I want to talk about is what is intellectual property? Fundamentally, there's three pieces of it that some are somewhat diametrically opposed. There's the famous prosecution. That's getting patents. I'm sure the audience has lots of people that have been involved with writing or generating or getting a patent. And everybody knows the first thing your patent lawyer will tell you, I want to get really broad claims. Well, the second piece of intellectual property is litigation. And I only learned this recently because I'm going through my first IP litigation. And the first thing that the litigation lawyer says, I want really narrow claims. Why? Because broad claims let in broad swaths of prior art. What you really want, and, and, and so you've got this, if you just write patents and think, great, then we'll go do something with them. Most patents written by purely prosecutors are nigh on worthless in litigation. So they might be very interesting technology, but they're virtually worthless until you go through the strengthening process of taking broad claims and reducing them. And for, for my team at Peregrine, because I own all the intellectual property at Peregrine now, I literally try to explain this by saying, here's what sounds like the perfect patent on the prosecutor's side, a thing. 
I'm going to get a royalty on everything, right? Everything's a thing. <laughs> Guess what? So were the Roman roads. Oops, prior art, you're out. So very, very broad claims can't be used in litigation. You need narrow claims. But the problem with narrow claims is they're easy to get around. So if you write narrow claims, then your infringer will just step one step to the right and you'll miss them. So it's not a process of prosecution or litigation. Those two things are, there's that word again, combined. You actually have to have broad claims at first and then you have to have narrow claims and that's a process and that's part of what drives that 10 to 20 million dollars. So that, the third, and then the third piece of IP is licensing. Qualcomm Center. I mean, what would San Diego be without Qualcomm? Three quarters of Qualcomm's profit come from licensing. They're in the chip business so that they can keep creating IP so they can keep licensing it. Good for them. Everybody would like to be the next Qualcomm, but uh, and Don, you just brought it up. Qualcomm makes all that money because they got their standard approved in regulation and everybody had to do it. What's now called standards essential patent, you can't do that anymore. Inside the, F inside the patent office and the FCC, that's called the anti-Qualcomm rule. We're not going to hand a loaded gun to somebody and have them walk around the world and aim it at people. So now, if you want to be in a standard, you have to agree to these incredibly fair and reasonable rates. So again, now you're talking about regulation, patent office, uh, FCC in terms of how do they actually release a new standard, and then there's all the technology folks. So it's, it's no longer this monotonic one thing. It's actually this combination of things that's happening. And it's changing incredibly quickly because of the Supreme Court and all the pressure, the Google, Apple, Godzilla versus Rodan thing going on. Uh, so that's, uh, um, you know, I, I guess my words are to say what we used to think of as IP as a patent, it's just, yeah, I wish it was that simple, but it's incredibly more complicated now. And we need to, uh, to recognize that. And as we look at how does the university work on that, I think that's something that we need to inject into the university system um, in terms of how do they generate IP, what's the use of a, what is IP, and um, how to write, how to really write patents that are useful out in the industrial world. Thank you. Uh, the best laid plans, um, my little, uh, primer for Sujit also disappeared. Um, but I can tell you that uh, Sujit Day, who's our next speaker, is a professor at the Jacobs School here at UCSD. Um, he also was a key founder of the technology that went into Ortiva Wireless. Um, Ortiva was a San Diego-based company that specialized in optimizing video streaming across wireless networks and was acquired recently, maybe last year or the year before, in 2012 by Israel's a lot for an undisclosed sum. So, Sujit, you're, you're on. Thanks, Bruce. So, uh, after the two viewpoints that we heard, and I was just thinking that, you know, uh, what kind of viewpoint I'll bring out to uh, maybe slightly say a different story. Um, <clears throat> so maybe I'll, I'll uh, give you from a uh, faculty entrepreneur's point of view what uh, intellectual property means, you know, how, uh, and, and what, what can we do effectively with it. Uh, but before that, uh, Bruce has already mentioned that uh, we, based on actually technologies that we developed under a Cal IT2 program, uh, we started a company in 2004. And um, uh, the, uh, the interesting you know, dilemmas from an entrepreneur's point of view is something that I would sort of try to quickly uh, say. There are, there are various streams that are going through my mind, so I don't know whether I'll be able to present all of them cohesively or not, but I'll try. So uh, when we started in 2004, uh, based on the technology, as I said, developed uh, as part of a Cal IG2 program, uh, the first uh, dilemma, of course, that as an entrepreneur we had, and uh, Franz would know everything about it, uh, is uh, you know what kind of funding uh, that we start the company with, right? There are various different options, angel investors, uh, uh, garage operations, um, 
uh, you know, going to the regular investors, strategic investors, and so on. So that's one set of uh, choices that you have as, a, as any entrepreneur. Uh, but as a faculty entrepreneur, we also have this that, um, of course, I wanted to start the company based on the technologies we developed. And so we need to license the technologies from the university. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I had frankly heard before uh, that process was that it's difficult to license from the university. And uh, I have gone into various events and I've heard that uh, same kind of uh, observation. And uh, one of the things that uh, we did, and Franz was actually very, very uh, helpful in that process, was figure out um, you know, how do we, and there's a simple, uh, almost a simple um, formula, I would say. Uh, I don't know whether we have anyone from our technology transfer office here or not. Oh, there, there. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> But, uh, but you know, something that really helped and something that made the process very, very uh, smooth for us is that we studied similar kind of deals from various other universities. And we went with a simple plan. I didn't go, but you know, uh, a team went uh, with a proposal. And the technology transfer office was very, very cooperative. Uh, very, you know, it was a very simple process. And we came back with a, a technology licensing deal within two months. And so that is something that I have recommended to others that uh, you know, if, you, if you know exactly where you want to go and uh, if, you, if you are fair and honest about you know, what the deal structure should be, then at least you know, in our experience it has worked out very well and very, very quickly. Now why this is important is because we chose the regular investment route. And the regular VC uh, investment route uh, one of the things that they really want is to make sure that uh, licensing is clear. And so this really helped. What the technology transfer office could do effectively and efficiently it really helped do the, uh, uh, the, the fundraising. Now, uh, I mentioned that, I, and I'll sort of um, um, you know, mention these dilemmas, uh, uh, sort of mix up the IP dilemmas here. So uh, you know, one of the the other thing is that how much of technology licensing to do, right? Because you know, you have a vision of a company, uh, you think you know, but you actually know very little at that time. Because yes, you have studied the market, yes, you have gone out to some customers and so on, but doing it is very different from hypothesizing about it. And uh, of course, your licensing deal will depend upon you know how many licenses or what kind of licenses you'd like to have. So that is another point that, uh, and I can talk about this offline, I'll not have time to, but uh, time to sort of talk about it comprehensively, but that is another thing that you know, I think that an entrepreneur needs to do, is to figure out you know, what kind of uh, structure and what kind of packaging you'd like to do, you know, because you have multiple technologies that can be potentially useful or not. Now, uh, one of the things that I found out as an entrepreneur is extremely useful to have intellectual property protection uh, and I think that there will be two reasons why I would do uh, intellectual property protection and spend money on it, is for investors and customers, not really to protect yourself. And you know, I uh, uh, very much agree with what uh, David mentioned, that as an entrepreneur I saw that execution is a key to success, not so much the intellectual property protection. And I'll come back to that. But what I realized is that investors are very, very, um, you know, if you're starting a technology-based company, then uh, the licensing deals, but also, and also the, you know, what kind of revenue sharing structure and all that, but that the intellectual property is covered because they want to know that uh, you have a differentiation and a barrier to entry, right? Others have a barrier to entry. So that is one uh, good reason that why you should go for intellectual property protection and pay whatever the, you know, needs to be paid. The second, surprisingly, that I found out through my eight years of experience, and again, this is, uh, I'm talking about B2B businesses and not B2C businesses. B2C business, uh, like you know, WhatsApp and things that are totally different. But if you do want to do a B2B business, chances are that the enterprises that you're selling to and whatever kind of enterprises are going to be very, very keen on figuring out what kind of intellectual prop property protection you have. Why? Because uh, I think that's something that Ron mentioned. Uh, Ron mentioned about Supreme Court cases. But what I have seen in the field is that many of our murky customers are getting into frivolous lawsuits. So think of a mobile operator, and the mobile operator is you know, doing as simple as delivering data, right? data packets. 
or you know web or video and things like that getting sued saying that you know it might be violating this patent or that patent and so to protect itself the mobile operator then needs to ensure or needs to show that everything that it has deployed is covered by intellectual property and that they don't uh, you know that they don't um, overlap with what this company is claiming so we have had these experiences and actually multiple of them so uh, and, and actually, it's happening more both with content providers and carriers. Uh, these are the two spaces I know. And so uh, that is a second reason why I think an entrepreneur should be motivated to protect his or her intellectual property. In terms of uh, the, the, uh, the main reason that we used to think that why we should go for intellectual property protection, at least that's what I used to think, that uh, as an entrepreneur, I want to protect my business. What I found out is that uh, there are three reasons, today it's becoming more and more, that why that is not as much the case. Uh, one is that it's taking awfully long time to get these um, uh, patents granted. Uh, you know, I think that sometimes the, many of our foreign applications got granted much faster than our US applications. That was very frustrating. But you know, if it takes four or five years, and I would say a typical technology, the life cycle is about three, four years now. It's moving very fast, right? So we made uh, the first set of products. By another three years, you know, we are making a second set of products. Another three years, we are making a third set of products. So uh, by the time the patents come back granted, uh, you know, you have moved on to selling other products. So uh, what, I, what we found out is execution is a key to uh, make sure that you are winning business and you know, staying ahead of your potential competition. The second thing I'll point out, again, from my own experience, is that uh, there are various things that competitors will do, be they in Singapore or be they in US. You know, I, I didn't see much difference in the practice. And that is, they will do certain things that intellectual property protection will not be able to protect against that competition. And I'm happy to uh, talk about that more in details, either at the panel or outside. So again, what we found out is the right kind of messaging, the right kind of marketing, and the right kind of execution in terms of getting the, you know, getting those conversations with customers to POs uh, and you know, staying deployed and so on are the right things to do as opposed to spending money too much on intellectual property protection. The third thing I'll say that is this pertains to smaller entrepreneurs that um, you know, in our experience that protecting in all the key markets, the key ge geographics, uh, was costing for each patent about 200K. And uh, you know, small entrepreneurs cannot afford to pay that kind of money. So something that we didn't have, you know, this is all uh, learning by fi in fire, uh, that you know, I think that we need to come up with, any small entrepreneur needs to come up with a, a vision of what markets, you know, essentially a go-to market strategy together with patent license, patent filing, need to go hand in hand, which I think most small companies don't do, at least we were not doing. So we were spending a lot more money on our first few patents and a lot less on the later, because by that time we are realizing, oops, you know, it's just costing too much. So that is a third, has become a third impediment for small entrepreneurs to protect themselves. And thereby what I would uh, say to any uh, entrepreneur in the room or any aspiring entrepreneur is that you need to do uh, protection uh, because of invest investments and because of also because of exits uh, and also because of uh, customers. And in terms of your own uh, for protection for yourself, you need to focus on execution. And of course, you know a, a well-planned strategy where you are not burning too much cash, but you are protecting in some key markets where you want to sell. With that, I would end. Thank you. I think we could open it for uh, questions at this time. Um, I thought to get the ball rolling, um, I would ask Dave a question. Oh, good, because <laughs> then I have a comment. <laughs> um, I'm told, Dave, that most, th most uh, startup companies fail because of mistakes that the founders make at the very beginning. I don't know that that's true. I mean, uh, well, uh, let's, uh, most startup companies, let, let, let's, let's divide the vast majority of startups and that little tiny, tiny, tiny slice that are venture funded startups, okay? Because that's what people often think of, I at least in these kind of 
of Davos, because in fact, most of the world's startups are not such entities like, like Peregrine or, or, um, or Teva. But, but um, so I'd say no, they're, they're usually failures of markets. And by that you mean? You're either too early or you're too late. You, you know, um, that, that in fact, for example, very few projects fail because the technology doesn't work. It maybe costs you a little bit more. It maybe doesn't work quite the way you thought. But um, I, I would say it's usually market timing is wrong, mm. either too early or too late. You know, I, I'm always reminded of uh, John Doerr from Kleiner Perkins, uh, who in, uh, I think it was 97, 98, 98, famously said that the internet was not overhyped. And of course, he proved to be right. You know, two years before that, Kleiner Perkins had m put about a quarter of their portfolio into tablet computers because that was the next wave in 1995. Mm. And all that money just, you know, flushed down the toilet, and we now know was only, you know, 20 years ahead of its time. Hmm. Okay. Well, I guess um, now can I go back to my issue? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Because I'll let you all in on one dirty little secret and then a request for the university. Which is the dirty little secret is, and, and I'm going to take exception a little bit with my friend Rory here. The dirty little secret is venture capitalists, for the most part, are great at marketing. It is their best skill, reading markets despite being wrong. It's what they're better at. They're not great engineers, typically. They're not great finance guys, typically, but it's what they spend their time thinking about. So we're great at marketing. So there's this myth that venture capitalists spend their days walking the halls of universities looking for technology to form companies. When in fact, I would argue that what makes, for example, Stanford successful is that the faculty and graduate students are walking the halls looking for technologies to start companies and being rewarded for doing that. And that, in fact, if you can create a culture within the university where starting a company is important for tenure, is important for how big your lab space is, is important for your grad students, you will see this dynamic change because people do what they're rewarded for. So we all know you get rewarded for writing papers, right, and getting published, et cetera. But I would argue at Stanford you get rewarded for being a founder of a company. I mean, God, Don Kennedy was like a founder and investor in I don't know how many companies. So I, I would, you know, and, and, and our, our um, prior chancellor, w when she arrived, got excoriated for having commercial ties when she arrived, you know, and it's, I mean, just so if, if even more so than the licensing office, we can change the culture, which is a lot harder, it's easier to change the licensing, but if you can change the culture that says, in fact, bringing innovations out is important, and we've worked at, right? I mean, Connect was formed for that purpose. Von Liebig was formed for that purpose, but I think it really starts at the top of changing this <coughs> culture and saying that that is, in fact, an important role that you, as a faculty member, as a grad student, play within the university, then we will begin to see uh, just an enormous explosion. Okay. Um, are there any questions? A end of lecture. Yeah. <laughs> I would say you know, where I was kind of going with my question, Dave, was, um, you know, that uh, you know, when startup founders are talking about mistakes they made they you know they'll sometimes talk about well we had a third founder we you know we divided the ownership of the company equally and then the third founder didn't stay and we had But that's a minor thing. Um, yeah. it, the the question that I wanted to get at is uh, it, whether you have any insight in terms of mistakes that founders make at the beginning in terms of IP. Oh, all kinds of mistakes. So just give, give us some for example. I mean, they don't think about it. I mean, it's probably the number one mistake. They, they, they're, they're broke, and so they don't get 
the patent protection they need in a country that's important because they don't think through, okay, where am I going to give up and not prosecute a patent because I can't afford to prosecute it everywhere? Where, what, what markets am I going to, um, to pursue? Um, I don't really want to license my technology right at day one, but I might for Ecuador, Peru, and Chile because I can't afford to prosecute there and there are smaller markets or something. So certainly around intellectual property, they, they don't, th that would be the mistake they make is they, they don't think strategically about it. And what's the consequence? Of how does that play out? It plays out when, when you go to sell your company to a big acquirer who thinks about it a lot because they get their butt sued all the time. I mean, I don't know, Ron, you tell me. What was your yeah. experience? Mm -hmm. Well, Mike's, I have another phrase. I like little phrases. That capital comes with instructions. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you write a business plan. A guy writes a check. He's telling you to go do that. And sometimes he says, but not this and not that. So to me, a lot of it is your investors are telling you whether IP is important to them or not. I, I, I would, I would say if, if there is a venture-backed firm that has a credible plan and they're a year and a half into this and then coconut sound, we forgot about patents. That came from the root investment because it was, n it, was, it was never explained by the investors. Yes, I know you want one more design engineer, but you've got to carve out at least enough to get, you know, the, at least spend a little time on what is your IP value. So, so you see this great divide, right? The, the biotech guys, investors, are going, going to Ron's biotech point, aside, they, yes. they start their due diligence right. with a patent review and an IP review, okay? I, I guarantee you the, the, the social media who has wouldn't know a patent if it like came up and smacked them in the face. So um, I, I think Ron's on a, on a good track. There. Mark. Microphone. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I, I, hello? <laughs> I really enjoyed your comments about the various natures of IP and investing and all of that is those things. Um, I had a, a couple of comments, I think, that I'd like to hear feedback from you on. Um, one is um, regarding chip companies, you saw talk about Peregrine. Uh, we happen to have Intel, Justin Ratner was on our stage prior, and he announced um, that they had been hacked in the Aurora hack. Or I don't think he did that out of the goodness of his heart. I think that the SEC had had a quiet communication with Paul, and, and it, was, it went something like this. I'm making it up. Um, you had a material event that will affect the, val the shareholder value of your company, and you need to disclose. And that's why they disclosed. Mm -hmm. So I would disagree with you um, on that point, because I think that the SEC is going to get increasingly involved, regardless of what your investors tell you. The SEC, if you're a public company, will tell you, uh, you just had a material event because you didn't protect enough or because you didn't disclose, you've now created a liability for your corporation and, and for your shareholders. So increasingly, I hope that we'll have disclosures when there are massive attacks like Aurora. Um, and I think it's going to be pulled out of the hands of you know, voluntary disclosure or into the world of required disclosure because it really is material whether you like it or not. And my other thought is a little more um, broad, I think. but. All this, all this conversation of what is IP or what isn't IP, um, on some level it doesn't matter. What matters is how do you make money? So whether you're combining things, whether you're living in a world where it's a Twitter world, or whether, whether it's like Nortel, whether it's emails that are being read, whether your lawyer's emails are being read because you're trying to do a deal in Europe and, and you can't get a bid without the other guy knowing, that's all IP. And, and any of that that gets stolen that, that, that turns your company into dust, uh, is the same practice. It's theft of IP to put you out of business so somebody else, some other shareholder can benefit. Now, I think we need to have a broader view of what IP is than just the old view of a, a legal wrapper around a patent. We really need to expand our view. And the best way to do that is to ask the thieves because the thieves are pretty clear on what's valuable and what they want to take. And I think we are, we're behind the game in defining that 
in the same way. We can just see it through their eyes because they're very clear on how valuable all your stuff is and in, in what ways. We don't always have a way of discussing that as intellectual property. We, we think it's an email, but it, it might be intellectual property at the same time. And I guess last, when I hear you guys talk very, very specifically about just chips, or that's over now in San Diego, never be a chip company again, oh, come on. So, you know, I, I, I see people making things like graphene 3D printers. We, there are so many things that will be just like a chip company uh, in, in materials or in biotech or in genetics or in medicine, all of which are being formed right now, all of which could be patented if you want to patent. I don't think those days are over. I think we're just going through. Well, I think there's a huge difference between saying there's going to be innovative companies mm -hmm. and there's going to be startup independent chip companies. I don't know about chips. It'll be, okay. What about graphene printers? So or stem printers, you know? Or so I think it doesn't matter about chips so much as it matters about are are we going to see three hundred fifty dollar, three hundred fifty billion dollar market cap companies again, whether it's in San Diego or Chicago? Yes, we are. And it'll be based on real science and technology, not just on me sending you a message and then it evaporates. Was there a question in there? <laughs> 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 I'm just teasing you. No, I, I, I wanted to make a comment on that, that uh, yes, so uh, I agree with you that the way intellectual property is defined today, and this is also going through shifts, right? I mean, you know, about, I remember 20 years back, algorithms would not be, you cannot protect it. It has to be a process. And so many of us who would come up with algorithms would be trying to, you know, sort of blend it into what was protected at that time. And then more and more software is protected today. I mean, intellectual property. So I think that the definition of intellectual property needs to change and needs to change to cover uh, the innovations in Twitter and those kind of things. Uh, as well as on you know various kinds of marketing innovations and um, communication innovations. So uh, what is innovation? That definition, I think, needs to change from fundamental technologies outwards. Well, you know, one thing that I hear is that the legal wrapper that goes r with intellectual property really isn't protecting the value of what you've created. And... Um, and so uh, it seems to me that kind of the more fundamental problem isn't so much whether you've got IP protection for something that you've invented as how are you going to go about protecting it. And, and it kind of reminds me, the, the conversation we had previously sort of reminds me of sometimes of some of the um, like network security administrators that I've talked to uh, uh, who complain about you know, we're under siege in our network system and, you know, w w we have just this constant barrage of, uh, of assaults on our network and I can't get the CEO to change the priorities um, so that I can defend the system. Yeah. So, anyway. So, I guess, Mike, that's, I think you helped me make my point. I don't, first of all, IP is a very small percentage patents. Secondly, patents come with a really serious problem. You have to teach how to do your invention, and then you publish it. So if it's, if it, there's an issue now which markets are changing way faster than the, than the legal system can respond. That's why we have the ITC, which is a nuclear bomb, and very, very difficult, but it's very fast. So you look at a lawsuit today, and it can take anywhere from three to five, typically five years if you go all the way through all the appeals. In the handset business, that's five generations. Where were we five years ago? The iPhone 3, something like that. I'm making it up, but it's like that. So the issue of the defending of patents through the legal system is all, really it's all about timing. When markets are moving faster than the legal system can respond, then it's all all in for the thieves because and, and the stock market doesn't care suppose you even get proven you stole 200 million dollars worth of my stuff and I'll even get a triple damages in there it's all in the past these are not the droids you're looking for I'm worried about your P&L next next quarter right so the, the whole system is really that's the point of all these changes and the Supreme Court is actually a trailing indicator it's not a leading indicator of anything. It's dealing with things that have been going on in society for the last 10 or 20 years. 
and finally it gets to the Supreme Court. So the fact that there's now more Supreme Court cases in the last eight years than there were in the previous 50 is telling you this whole thing is in turmoil. And now as industry is really moving to this combinatorial thing, I think Don makes a good point. The most valuable thing is a sense of there's a market opportunity here. I mean, Larry Page, okay, he invented a better way to do a, a search. But search had been around for 10 years. What he saw was a, actually his great invention was he figured out how to monetize searching. It Which actually was not his great invention, but in, in fact an invention of Bill Gross's in Pasadena that, that they acquired. Right. However yeah. he got it, the point is he figured out how to monetize it. That was really yeah. the genius of Google. There was a question. Yeah. yeah, this gets back to the, I'm trying to be, well, our team is trying to be a fabulous IC market. Am I going to be crazy? I don't have 100 million. We're off by a factor of about 10 or 20. But we are trying to make a go of it. This question is for Ron. Do you think that is really true? I, I don't, we don't have to do a billion transition what we're doing, but I still see it's there. I see like Max Linear, you know, here in San Diego, which did those nice TV receivers. And we're going to try to pull a trick off like that too. And, and they're successful. So uh, what's your opinion? You know, I was on one, a panel recently, and the VP of Business Development from Broadcom was there. And this is more for big digital ICs than for analogy stuff. So that's a little details on the chip stuff. So, you know, first of all, never say never. If there's an opportunity, uh, you know, there's always an opening for somebody to go grab it. But what that, what the VP of BizDev at Broadcom said was, what I really want is I want you to tell me that you could do this and give me a proof of principle and I'll do that for 10 million and I'll buy it for 50. But don't spend 100 or 200 million reducing it to practice and expect me to pay you 500 for it. I just won't do it because I'm just going to I'm just going to integrate it with my system in 6 to 12 quarters anyway. So, you know, if if frankly at the, at Peregrine we probably if you count up all the paid in capital, all the revenues till we got cash flow positive, all of the in-kind services from everybody from Intel to IBM to Xilinx to companies who loved our technology. There was between a half and three quarters of a billion dollars invested in Peregrine. And only about 5% of that was on technology. The rest of it was on quality systems and manufacturings and supply chain setup and guaranteeing volumes to get into these incredibly high volume markets. So I don't, in a way, it doesn't really matter how good the dingus is. You've still got to do the whole supply chain and and sales channel, and that's that's actually where the the costs are. I mean, today our standards, we ship 0.1 parts per million field failure rate. So we ship 10 million chips and get one back. And if you can't do that, nobody's going to buy it because nobody wants these things coming back. It's just the answer. You know, it's a it's a 15 cent, 20 cent chip, and this is 600 bucks. The ratio just says it can't fail. So there's, I think, I, actually I believe that's all true for almost everything manufacturing. I think we're really seeing the, the decline of manufacturing, largely because it's going to go into these huge factories that are overseas, state capital funded, because they just, they, that, that's a good deal for China to pull somebody out of a rice paddy and put them into a fab and pay them $2 an hour to run and push a button on an auto, on a machine. So I, I really think the whole, the whole question of everybody says you want manufacturing jobs back. Really, be careful what you wish for. Go look at it. Go look at what people are getting paid to do manufacturing jobs. They are where they belong to be. The value is in, you know, creating what they should be <coughs> manufacturing, the design and all that. So I don't know if that answered your question, but you know, I think it's a, it's a tough road to hoe. Um, we are at the appointed hour. I see there's one more question here, um, and I want to be sure that everybody who has a question want get, gets a chance to ask it, but I would remind you that we are going to have a reception afterwards, and um, you can ask then. But please, go ahead. So, Ron, you said we're post-information age. It's all about information at this point, which means that the way you compete is you have a, an asymmetry of information. You know something somebody else doesn't know. 
And what the patent process does is slows down the time that somebody else can get to know what you know, or at least it used to do that, or at least get from what you knew to what you wanted to deliver into the market. But the bad guys don't work with in the same rules and the same laws as the patent constructs were intended to. So every time I hear somebody talk about patents, I think, well, that's all well and good for people to play by the rules of patents. But in our company, we're in this what I call sort of a, an adversarial engineering world where we've got to be faster and better than the bad guys, right? And so it seems like the best way to slow things down is to obfuscate and hide all of your information advantage, whether it's 10 Sigma manufacturing, the knowledge to do that, or if it's uh, uh, how you design a Gatorade or anything like that. But it seems like it's about how fast or how long can you sustain an asymmetry, an advantage of information asymmetry. And patents don't do anything for that. So I just wanted to kind of throw it out there and ask the question to you guys. Are patents going to be essentially dead here in the next five years? No, I, you know, I don't think so. Because um, you know, if you look at all the lawsuits that are going on, right? so essentially there has to be a mechanism to defend you. And so sometimes there'll be, uh, if, you, if you have not patented something, uh, then there might be allegations that you are violating someone else's patents. And so it's a defensive mechanism, definitely, and I think it's going to... But if you buy what I said, they won't matter because somebody already will have that intellectual property be doing what you want. They will have that asymmetry. They will have an advantage. They will have taken it away, which means that in China, they'll be manufacturing whatever it is that you had invented. And so then patent laws don't apply there. So the real competition isn't coming from somebody in Silicon Valley competing with somebody in San Diego. It's coming from somebody in Shenzhen competing with somebody in San Diego. Patents don't matter. Yeah, l let me make a <coughs> quick historical observation. That was true in Japan in the 50s. And they just copied everything. And then they got better and they advanced. And guess what happened? They started creating their own intellectual property. Japan is now one of the most safest places to to create intellectual property. Korea went through the same pattern. China's actually, the pendulum's actually starting to swing back because, I mean, for the one business I know a little bit about, the chip business, they've got, they've got billions of dollars invested in these fabs and people will not give them, the IBM is not gonna give the 14 nanometer node to SMIC unless SMIC is, is absolutely cleaner on IP than anybody else. So I know personally the president of HHNEC, and he said, we have a completely open door policy. You can walk in here anytime you want. If you've licensed us your IP, you have a special badge, and you can go anywhere you want and say, wait a minute, that's my thing out on an open desk. So there's, as they start generating their own IP, I think they will eventually start being more respectful of it, but that's a long process. A snapshot in time, I completely agree with you. I just think you know, China's right now in that very early stage of just turning the corner. Um, I know when I first started, you, you remember when the CD kiosks were everywhere? You could go, you could buy a, a DVD for a buck anywhere, even in Shanghai, the most sophisticated city. You don't see those places anymore. I, I, don't, I can't see, I haven't seen no, them. No, it's all downloadable. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> but but I, I, I agree with you in a snapshot, I think 50 years from now it could be better, but in the interim it's going to be the Wild West and it's pretty dangerous. So um, I want to disagree slightly. I, I think that if we look at Japan, um, what we saw in the 70s was they, did, they took about five major industries out of the United States, none of, none of which ever came back, and that basically built Japan. Um, and they incrementally improved on those from cars to steel to DRAMs so since that time. Um, I haven't seen them invent the next flying car. So I don't think that they really did turn to be an innovative society. And I think the reason for that is if you get really good at copying things, it doesn't make you good at inventing things. It's not a natural next step. And I think if we look at South Korea, we see the same thing again. South Korea did to Japan what Japan did to the United States. But I don't see the flying car coming out of South Korea either. I think even that stem cell stuff turned out to be fake. So, so it's really doubtful to me that they're, they're going to be the next great inventors coming out of South Korea. 
and I watch China, and it would be hopeful. I think what you're saying is hopeful, but I, I don't see it. And it's, I think I would call it a meme. It's something that we would like to believe, but there's no evidence for it yet. But what, what we are seeing um, is a ramping up of theft. So that, that part we know is true. If you'd ask people like Elon Musk, this comes back to your question, I think, Jeff, because Elon wouldn't patent a single, there was no patent that came out of SpaceX. He didn't want China to know a single thing about his secrets. And that, I think that's the future. Up, up in C Seattle, the legal trend seems to be totally away from patenting because we know that there are whole teams in other countries who do nothing but read the patent thing every day, and then they bracket patent around it. And, and nobody wants to go there. So instead, they find they use trade secret law or some other protection instead of patenting. It's, it's whole, just a whole different game now, I think, than, than it was 10 years ago. I think I'm agreeing with you. Yeah, I think we're probably agreeing. OK, thanks, Jeff. <laughs> Larry, do you want it? I was just going to say that because I was trying to stop. <laughs> <laughs> with, with agreement. Um. <laughs> oh, disagreement so much more fun, though, Larry. Uh, yeah, I know, but we've, we've, been, we've been having hours of that. That's, uh, I wanted just to thank uh, uh, everybody uh, for uh, coming. It's been a long afternoon. Uh, a lot of you have stayed here. Um, lots of just wonderful exchange. Uh, we're going to have a networking reception outside uh, now until about 6.30. Uh, so I hope a lot of you can get FaceTime with uh, a lot of the panelists or each other. Um, thanks all. Thanks all of you for coming. And again, this was, you know, our attempt here at the Qualcomm Institute. Thank Ramesh Rao for his hospitality uh, here, uh, to get started. What I hope will be uh, a continuing um, and, and deepening uh, discussion about that. And if what uh, Dean Pisano uh, foreshadows uh, actually comes to pass, we're going to need a lot more insight and a lot more prioritization of, you know, our patents, this, or our this. I mean, if we're going to be turning out more entrepreneurs, we're going to need that kind of advice and, and seasoning and, and the fact that the world is changing and changing more rapidly every day. Uh, and so having all of these experts helping us uh, is, is the way I think we're going to grow uh, San Diego to the next level. Thanks a lot for everybody, and let's go on out and have some reception. Thank you.